Good afternoon, everybody. Please be seated. Routine proceedings, introduction of bills. The Honorable Member for McPhillips. Thank you very much, Speaker. I move, seconded by the MLA for Dauphin, that Bill Number 224, the Un Unobstructed Access to Healthcare and Education Facilities Act, be now read a first time. It has been moved by the Honorable Member for McPhillips, seconded by the Honorable Member for Dauphin, that Bill Number 224, the Unobstructed Access to Healthcare and Education Facilities Act, be now read a first time. The Honorable Member for McPhillips. This bill will ensure that individuals have access to medical and educational facilities without being unnecessarily obstructed or harassed. I look forward to all, houses, all, all members uh, 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 voting in support of this resolution. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. The Honourable Member for St. Vitale. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, seconded by the member for St. James, that Bill 244, the Protection, Protecting Youth and Sports Act, be read for the first time. It has been moved by the Honourable Member for St. Vital, seconded by the Honourable Member for St. James, that Bill Number 244, the Protecting Youth in Sports Act, be now read a first time. The Honourable Member for St. Vital. Madam Speaker, every child should feel safe on their own sports team. This bill would create a policy to protect children and youth in sports from abuse or harassment by creating guidelines for coaches, sports organizations, schools, and parents. Manitoba families have been calling for action from this government to keep kids safe. So far, they have missed the mark. This bill will help to give families the peace of mind they deserve when their child joins a sports team. Thank you. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed? Agreed, Agreed and so ordered. Committee reports. Tabling of reports. And I am pleased to table the following reports. Report of amounts claimed and paid pursuant to Section 4 of the Member's Salaries, Allowances and Retirement Plans Disclosure Regulation for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2022. Report on amounts paid or payable to members of the Assembly pursuant to subsections 52.27 bracket 1 and bracket 1.1 of the Legislative Assembly Act for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2022. I would like to note for the information of all members, the report titled Amounts Paid or Payable to Members of the Assembly will be distributed electronically to all members. Ministerial statements. <clears throat> the <clears throat> Honourable Minister of Families and I would indicate that the 90 minutes notice prior to routine proceedings was provided in accordance with our Rule 26 bracket 2. Would the Honourable Minister please proceed with her statement? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize that today, October 4th, is the National Day of Action for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. It feels especially important this year to mark this day and commit to taking serious action to address violence against Indigenous women and girls given the devastating number of Indigenous women and girls lost to violence this year in our province. I would like to read into the record the names of six women who tragically lost their lives to senseless violence and to ask that we have a moment of silence to reflect on the loss of Heather Beardy, Rebecca Contois, Doris Trout, Tessa Perry, Danielle Ballantyne, Michaela Gerard Rusin. These are the names of six Indigenous women that have been killed in Manitoba this year alone. And we know that there were likely many more names who we will never know. Like everyone in this chamber, I was saddened and disheartened to learn, disheartened when I learned of each of their deaths. These women were daughters, mothers, sisters, and friends. They were loved and they are missed. They all deserve to live long lives free of violence. 
This is why it is important to recognize this day of action and the role government has to play in ensuring that our province is safe for all Manitobans. The final report of the MMIWG inquiry, guided by the voices of survivors and their families, highlighted systemic issues such as racism, sexism, and colonialism that have contributed to the high rates of violence against Indigenous women, girls, and the 2SLGBTQQIA people that we see in Manitoba today. The final report also emphasized the importance of centering Indigenous voices and community-led solutions to address the violence against Indigenous women and girls. We are committed to taking concrete steps to respond to the calls for justice in a collaborative way, building on the relationships we have established to support that work here in Manitoba. Our government recognizes the magnitude of work that needs to be done, as well as our role in addressing these harms. We will continue to work alongside Indigenous families, survivors, leadership, communities, and organizations. Real change in terms of addressing violence against Indigenous women and girls will only be achieved through sustained and coordinated action. We are committed to working with our partners and all Manitobans. As we mark this National Day of Action on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, I encourage everyone to take the time to listen to the voices of families and survivors to take part in one of the many events happening around the province today and to reflect on actions that you can take within your own life to help create a society where everyone can feel safe and valued. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for St. John's. October 4th is Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls and Two-Spirited Honouring and Awareness Day in Manitoba. It's a day to honour Indigenous women, girls and two-spirited, stolen and taken from their families, children and communities, while offering support to their grieving families. The ongoing genocide of Indigenous women, girls and two-spirited is predicated on colonial violence waged on our bodies. It's predicated on racist, misogynistic social constructions of Indigenous women as less than, as less deserving of protections and therefore more deserving of said violence. More often than not, Indigenous women, girls and two-spirited are blamed for the violence against our bodies. And MMIWG2S families, instead of uh, being on the receiving end of compassion, are often criticized or condemned for not doing enough as if families didn't protect and fight for their loved ones with every ounce of their being. While awareness has grown since 2000 when Indigenous women started to organize alongside families and highlight the issue of missing and murdered, said violence has not stopped. In fact, despite numerous government social justice reports, a national inquiry, and some project-based funding, some would argue violence has only grown. What we haven't seen is a commitment from various levels of government for a comprehensive programming funding towards safe and secure housing, training and education, and increased support to women's shelters and resource centers. Until we deal with, in a substantial way, the core issues that make Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited unsafe, we will only prolong this epidemic of violence. Here's the thing, Madam Speaker, Indigenous women, in particular matriarchs, are not taking this anymore. Not that we ever did, but with the advent of social media and access to increased means of accountability, matriarchs are demanding and affecting change. Over this last year, we've seen matriarchs come together to take down a serial predator and held accountable for preying on Indigenous women and girls. We are holding both governments and policing institutions to account on how they choose to address the crisis of MMIWG uh, to us. Indigenous women will not take this violence anymore or allow those who perpetrate violence in all of its form to continue to exact violence on our bodies anymore. And we expect men to take up that responsibility to protect and stand with Indigenous women. Today is one of those days where folks can demand more from their government, social service agencies, and police in ending violence against Indigenous the women. The member's girls. time has expired. Is there leave to allow the member to conclude her statement? Uh, leave has been granted. The Honourable Member for St. John's. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Uh, today is one of those days where folks can demand more from their government, social service agencies, and police in ending violence against Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited. Finally, and most importantly, we continue to stand with MMIWG 2S families and send our profound love and strength to each and every one of them today and every day. Miigwech. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Uh, Madam Speaker, I ask for leave to respond to the Minister's statement. Does the Member have leave to respond to the statement? Leave has been granted. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise this afternoon to talk about the National Day of Action for Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls and Two-Spirited People. Madam Speaker, I want to begin by saying thank you and miigwech to all of those who have come to the Manitoba Legislature today and for allowing many of us to join you this afternoon in the Rotunda. There are many events today throughout Manitoba that have been created to raise awareness, further dialogue, and create much needed supports and shared understanding for the loss that so many have and continue to experience. Madam Speaker, it is incredibly heartbreaking that because of violence, many Indigenous women and girls go missing or are found murdered. I'm grateful for recent legislation implementing Claire's Law, but we as legislators still need to do more. It is exceptionally important to give that full and proper recognition for every person who has gone missing. Every single person who goes missing has a family whose lives are forever impacted. Madam Speaker, just in the last two weeks, a childhood friend of mine has gone missing. I want to thank Bear Clan, who have been vocal in raising awareness in the hopes of finding her. This was a friend of mine who I grew up with at church. We used to have playdates. There were about four of us in her basement, and her adopted parents would make us snacks, and we'd often blare music and play games. I'm praying that she is found safe. Our hearts go out to all of you, those who are missing, and those who have loved or love someone who may be missing or who has been murdered. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for bringing forward the statement. Is there leave for a moment of silence? Leave has been granted. Please stand. Further ministerial statements, the Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development, and I would indicate that the required 90 minutes notice prior to routine proceedings was provided in accordance with our Rule 26, Bracket 2. Would the Honourable Minister please proceed with his statement? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in the House today to recognize our conservation officers. On October 1st, we celebrated Manitoba Conservation Officers Recognition Day, acknowledging the essential work they do to protect public safety and valuable natural resources. Since 2017, Manitoba has acknowledged Conservation Officers Recognition Day, sharing appreciation for the professionalism and dedication of conservation officers who enforce a wide array of provincial acts and regulations that ensure natural resources will be preserved for future generations. Officers preserve and maintain the public peace while carrying out wide-ranging duties. In addition to resource enforcement, Manitoba's conservation officers respond to emergencies such as search and rescue missions, forest fires and floods, working collaboratively with other law enforcement agencies and first responders, and liaise and, and engage with communities, stakeholders and rights holders. Conservation officers are highly skilled and versatile, providing service all across the province from commercial fisheries on Lake Winnipeg to working with polar bears in northern Manitoba. We also acknowledge the dangers conservation officers face while undertaking these duties. To all members of the Manitoba Conservation Officers Service, thank you for your dedicated service and unwavering commitment to protecting the people and natural resources of Manitoba. Recently, my department changed the titles of our conservation officers to align with the rank structure 
used by other conservation or law enforcement agencies across Canada. This reinforces the service as a recognized law enforcement agency. <coughs> as our province's third largest law enforcement agency, the Conservation Officer Service provides a vital frontline service that ensures public safety and protects our valuable natural resources and environment. As part of our long-term efforts, my department has developed a bold new strategy to revitalize our Conservation Officer Service with the resources and tools they need to protect the safety and security of Manitobans. Our plan will address long-standing issues with recruitment and retention that will enable Manitoba to compete for talented recruits in the job market and ensure we have a robust complement of officers with the skills, training and tools to protect the safety and security of Manitobans and our valuable natural resources. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Wolseley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. October 1st has been designated Manitoba Conservation Officers Recognition Day since 2015. A day when we recognize the important work that conservation officers do to enforce the laws that protect our natural resources, educate the public, and aid the courts in investigations. It's important that we support these public service workers as they do significant work in preserving Manitoba's natural spaces and wildlife and ensuring sustainability so we can continue to enjoy Manitoba's beautiful outdoors in the future. Conservation officers have an important role and carry a significant responsibility for protecting people and the environment. Their day-to-day -day work includes dealing with people who are armed, fishery violations, illegal fish sales, and illegal hunting. They enforce acts pertaining to natural resources, fish and wildlife, protected areas, and environmental protection. As part of the work, they catch poachers, conduct investigations into illegal hunting and fishing, and testify in court about these cases. They also help to defend against fires and floods. This is important work for maintaining sustainable wildlife populations, and it's often dangerous work as well. As the third largest armed law enforcement agency in the province, conservation officers deserve unique recognition for putting their lives on the line every day. Manitoba is home to beautiful natural spaces and we are proud of our abundant waterways, lakes and wetlands, which help make our province such a great place to live and raise a family. We want to protect these treasured spaces and ensure that they are there for future generations to enjoy and conservation officers are a crucial part of this conservation and sustainability work. So on behalf of the Manitoba NDP, thank you to all of Manitoba's conservation officers. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Madam Speaker, I ask for leave to speak to the Minister's statement. Does the Member have leave to respond to the Ministerial statement? Leave has been granted. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, Madam Speaker, conservation officers have been important in Manitoba for many, many years. They have been important as stewards of the wildlife in our province and have played an important role in the management of our provincial parks. Conservation officers enforce all resource-based legislation relating to wildlife, forestry, parks, crown lands, and wildfires. And recently, they've had an additional fun function on the ground of the Manitoba Legislature helping to provide security. Uh, we thank the conservation officers for their assistance in this regard. Of course, conservation officers have powers similar to police officers. In the 1980s, it was conservation officers, uh, then called natural resource officers, who were involved in aiding the transplant of young bald eagles from here to Massachusetts and to New Jersey. And this uh, transplant turned out to be very successful from uh, no breeding, uh, successful breeding pairs in New Jersey in the 1970s to more than 100 breeding pairs in the last few years. Uh, it is an example of uh, conservation officers here playing a role uh, in North America, uh, helping to preserve an important wildlife species. Uh, it's clear that better funding is needed for equipment and technology to monitor wildlife populations. There have been major advances in monitoring uh, using drones, sophisticated telemetry to monitor movements, 
and sophisticated tagging and genetic studies to monitor population sizes. We need to ensure that conservation officers have the ability to provide better stewardship of wildlife as well as uh, to uh, do the important work they do in terms of wildfires and stewardship of forests. So we say on behalf of the Manitoba Liberals, a thank you, thank you, thank you, merci, miigwech to Manitoba's conservation officers. Member statements. The Honourable Member for Lakeside. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. It gives me great pride to have been part of the unveiling of the historic replicated Manitoba Assembly Speaker's Chair last month on September the 9th at the Interlink Regional Library in Stonewall. In 2011, the town of Stonewall received a donation to assist with the reproduction of the original chair that was lost in the 2007 fire. This solid walnut chair is a replica of the chair presented to Speaker Jackson on his retirement, the town of Stonewall founder, Samuel J. Jackson. Served as Speaker from 1891 to 1895. I'd like to thank the town of Stonewall for their efforts and commitment to overseeing this endeavor to a successful completion. Only twice in the history of Manitoba legislature has a speaker been gifted the speaker's chair. The original chair sat in Stonewall Jackson's home in Stonewall till his death in 1942. The chair was then sold, donated, damaged, repaired several times, until destroyed by fire. Woodworks Art out of Brandon were commissioned to build a replica chair. Research and design perfection took two years to complete, which took as much time as the actual building. A detailed match of the original as best it could be, photos from taken to the difficult to recreating the stunning craftsmanship. The speaker's chair is an excellent example of how an object may be served as a symbolic and functional purpose. The chair will be on display at the library in Stonewall until further notice. Madam Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to know that the speaker's chair has returned to Stonewall. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Point Douglas. Which, Madam Speaker, Bridget Tolley founded the Sisters and Spirit Vigils in 2005 to honour the lives of missing and murdered women, including her own mother. These vigils are held across Turtle Island and in 2017, October 4th, recognized here in Manitoba. We are the only province to recognize this day, thanks to the member from St. John's. While today has been the named the day to honour the lives of MMIWG2S, the grief that our loved ones and communities experience is not just felt on this day, it is felt each and every day. And so we need to remember and honour them every day. We need to spend every single day working to end this violence. Honouring doesn't mean just talking, it means action. Honouring means investing in social and cult cultural supports. It means addressing the root causes of colonialism, racism and misogyny and eradicating them from our communities and institutions. And here in this house, it means considering the needs of Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people in all of our policies and decisions. Today is about creating awareness of how each of us have a sacred responsibility to one another, to love one another, to take care of one another, to speak up and to end the violence, to take up action and to hold space in creating a better tomorrow. We need your help. We must end this. We must all do our part to challenge this. We owe it to our children and our next generation. I commit to ending violence by not perpetrating violence against anyone. Standing up and when I can, and when I witness acts of violence, that I commit to standing up against them. I ask each and everyone in this chamber to take an action, to hold space, to support families. I want to acknowledge Betty Linksleg, who is in the gallery today, that spoke at the event, that talked about action that families need so that they're not searching alone and feel alone and that their loved ones are forgotten. I want to send all of the uh, families, my love, and again, this could happen to anyone. What if it was your loved one, and what action are you going to take? The Honourable Minister of Families. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today to highlight the accomplishments of an amazing Riel constituent that I'm proud to call my friend. David Menier is someone who is known by many in the community as a friendly soccer, volleyball, and basketball coach, a fair and diplomatic referee, and a steadfast volunteer at the Greendale Community Centre. I met David 11 years ago when he walked into my campaign office, introduced himself, and said he wanted to help with my election and serve the community. From that day forward, not a day went by during that campaign where David wasn't knocking on doors, installing lawn signs, and engaging with the team. Even though we were not successful during that initial campaign, David's commitment remained steadfast. His enthusiasm never waned as we continued on the campaign trail until 2016 when we were finally successful. I remember at that time feeling as though we just crossed a finish line, but little did we know that the work was just beginning. David accepted a position in my office as my constituency assistant and began helping me set up an office and serving our constituents. Many times throughout the years, I've had folks in Riel come up to me, whether in the community, in the grocery store, or during walks in Hentleff Park, and tell me about the respectful and friendly service that they received from David while contacting my constituency office. As all of us in this chamber know, having a committed CA who becomes an extension of the MLA within the community is priceless. Apart from being involved in politics and community service, David has also spent several years in restaurant management, sales, and running a number of small businesses, all the while maintaining a focus on volunteer work and community involvement. He has volunteered in the Reading Recovery Program, coaching at Darwin, and helping youth in sport. David spent more than 15 years volunteering at the Greendale Community Centre as a soccer coach and 10 years experience as a soccer referee with the Winnipeg Youth Soccer Association. I am forever grateful for the years of service David committed to our community. He has recently retired to spend more time with his wife Leslie and their three children, Matthew, Michael and Amy. And David and Leslie are now celebrating 30 years of marriage this month. The member's time has expired. Is there leave to allow the member to complete her statement? Leave has been granted. The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am proud to call David Menier and his family my friends. And while David is now in retirement, he is still incredibly active in the community and continues to volunteer and help where needed. I ask all members of the Manitoba Legislative Assembly to help me honour him for the contributions he has made to our great province. The Honourable Member for St. John's. Great. Uh, Madam Speaker. On this October 4th, MMIWG Honouring and Awareness Day, it's important that we say Indigenous women, girls and two-spirited's name to give uh, life to their memory and uh, that their life was valued and worthy, Madam Speaker. And so, Melissa Cook, Melinda Linksleg, Rebecca Contois, Jana Williams, Doris Trout, Tessa Perry, Michaela Gerard Rusin, Amanda Cook, Angela Porman, Audrey Desjardins, Barbara Keem, Lorna Blacksmith, Caroline Sinclair, Jennifer McPherson, Barbara Bottle, Sharice Houle, Cheryl Duck, Constant Camerson, Crystal Saunders, Diana Rattlesnake, Felicia Solomon Osborne, Claudette Osborne Tau, Vanessa Briere, Francis Alaya, Geraldine Beardy, Geraldine Satie, Glenda Morisot, Marjorie Henderson, Hilary Wilson, Jamie McGuire, Jeanine Fontaine, Kathleen Leary, Crystal Andrews, Leah Anderson, Marie Banks, Marilyn Daniels, Marilyn Monroe, Melissa Chabois, Flora Muskego, Nicole Hans, M Myrna Latondra, Roslyn G Gabriel, Shirley Beardy, Simone Sanderson, Tanya Marsden, Tanya Nipponek, Teresa Robinson, Teresa Silva, Tiffany Skye, Tina Fontaine, Amber Gibosh, Sylvia Ann Gibosh, Aisha Hudson, Serena McKay, and thousands more across our territories. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, Madam Speaker, this week, October 2nd to the 8th, 
is Mental Illness Awareness Week. We need to focus on reducing the incidence of mental illness in Manitoba. Let me give some examples. Individuals with a learning disability often struggle with life and all too often develop a mental illness like anxiety or depression. We need to better support them. Individuals with specific physical health conditions where there's not adequate support for preventing it are more likely to develop a mental illness. An example is individuals with a latex allergy. Providing for a province in which latex gloves are not used anymore would go a long way to helping them. This week, October 2nd to the 8th, is also Latex Allergy Awareness Week. Individuals who are exposed to lead have a higher incidence of developing anxiety or depression. We need to act. Individuals who are involved in any way with the child welfare system are much more likely to have a mental illness as a report from the Manitoba Centre for Health Policy shows. By helping those with learning disabilities, reducing the use of latex gloves, reducing exposure to lead, and focusing on better help to support children and youth in our child welfare system, and even before they enter the child welfare system so they don't need to, we can reduce mental illness. On this week, Mental Illness Awareness Week, we should expect action. So far, we have not seen this action in Manitoba. I hope we do. Thank you, merci, miigwech. Oral questions, the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Home care services are essential health care. That's why it's so important to make sure that it is accessible and reliable. Seniors, families, depend on it. We learned of the heartbreaking decision of Sathya Kovac to access medical assistance in dying because she did not have the right home care services. We offer our sincere condolences to her family and her friends. How will the Premier fix the problems with home care highlighted by Ms. Kovac choosing to access medical assistance in dying? The Honourable First Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and on behalf of all of us um, here, our sincerest condolences are sent to the family, friends, and loved ones of uh, Sathya Kovac in, this, in these um, incredibly um, difficult circumstances. Uh, Madam Speaker, we know that ALS is a devastating disease that affects too many Manitobans, and uh, this is an absolute tragedy that's happened uh, to this individual family. I don't know all the details, Madam Speaker, uh, and the circumstances surrounding um, this particular case, Madam Speaker, but what I will say is that I know that um, the minister responsible for seniors is in the process of looking at home care and revamping home care in the province of Manitoba and will continue to move in that direction to ensure that it's there for Manitobans when they need it. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. Home care patients need uh, predictable and good quality home care services. We hear too many stories of cancelled appointments and inadequate supports. And we know there needs to be more investment in these frontline services, and this case certainly highlights that. I want to share some of the words of Ms. Kovac. She said, and I quote, I'm mad that I don't have dependable, reliable people and that it has worn me down. I don't have enough help, and that is the reason, period, end quote. What will the Premier do to fix the home care system? The Honourable First Minister. Again, Madam Speaker, the circumstances surrounding um, this are, are devastating to the family of uh, Sathya Kovac. It's an absolute tragedy, and we know that this debilitating disease, ALS, is devastating and affects, again, far too many people, not just in Manitoba, but around the world. And uh, we, we know that um, certainly when it comes to home care in the province of Manitoba, we recognize there's more work to be done, Madam Speaker, and that's exactly why uh, we set up the, the Ministry of Seniors, Madam Speaker, to ensure that we're listening to Manitobans and that we are coming to a conclusion on 
what is how to best serve seniors in their homes and those who need home care, Madam Speaker, and that is why the minister responsible for seniors is taking on that task uh, to ensure that there is a review done of the home care system in, in the province and that we find better ways to deliver those services to Manitobans who need it. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a final supplementary. As casework, we hear too many stories of cancelled appointments and inadequate supports for patients and families. Uh, and Ms. Kovac herself clearly said that she felt that the system failed her. There should be every effort made to ensure our home care system does not fail another Manitoban. Will the Premier tell the House today how she will ensure the crisis in home care ends? The Honourable First Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And part of the review that the uh, Minister responsible for seniors is undertaking in the province of Manitoba when it comes to home care, uh, part of that is, is obviously a staffing, uh, staffing challenges that we have. And again, Madam Speaker, that is nothing that's unique to Manitoba. Uh, we know that there's staffing challenges right across this country. Uh, and uh, we are working, I know, as, as my new role of of the Chair of the Council of Federation. I'll be working with my counterparts across the country as well as the federal government to find ways to recognize credentials uh, of those who are coming into our, our country uh, and into our province so that we can get them working in the front lines of our health care system. So that will all be a part of the review uh, of the uh, home care system here in the province of Manitoba as well, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a new question. Madam Speaker, we know that the crisis in our health care system continues to get more serious by the day. Patients suffer and frontline workers are asked to do more with less. We thank them for their heroic efforts and we come here to this place to demand that this government stop cutting health care. We've learned that their cuts to beds in Winnipeg continue. I'll table information from the Winnipeg Health Region's annual report that shows there are 28 fewer beds in Winnipeg hospitals than the year prior. We know that we need more beds to help ease the crisis in emergency rooms. But the question remains, why is the Premier cutting beds in Winnipeg hospitals? The Honourable First Minister. Well, once again, uh, Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition continues with his uh, false accusations. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, there's no facts uh, whatsoever in the statement that the Leader of the Opposition just made on the floor of this chamber, Madam Speaker. Uh, I do want to take this opportunity to thank all of those individuals who work within our health care system. Uh, we know that they do uh, work to help and save lives each and every single day in all aspects of our health care system. And we help them, nurses, doctors, health care aides, uh, everyone, Madam Speaker, who works in that system plays a very, very important role. And we want to thank them for what they do. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. The facts are clear. They're in black and white in the document that I just tabled. There are 28 fewer beds in hospitals in the capital region of our province. That affects Winnipeggers. That affects all Manitobans, seeing as we serve people from across uh, the various health regions here in Winnipeg. When we look at those numbers, we see that even Brian Pallister funded more hospital beds than this Premier. And yet, no one thinks Brian Pallister did a good job with our health care system. Will the Premier tell this House why she cut 28 beds from Winnipeg hospitals last year? The Honourable First Minister. Well, once again, Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition continues with his litany of false accusations on the chamber floor here uh, today, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, what I will say is that uh, we are um, investing almost a billion dollars or over a billion dollars more today than the NDP ever did uh, when they were uh, in power in the province of Manitoba. We remember those dark days when 20 uh, rural ER hospitals uh, closed uh, under right. their watch. That was, that was hundreds uh, of beds right across this province, Madam Speaker. We remember those days 
and Manitobans don't want to go back to those dark days. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a final supplementary. Madam Speaker, the crisis in our health care system is worse than it has ever been. Talk to any patient, talk to anyone who works on the front lines, and they will tell you that. And now we table the proof for what is contributing to this. This government reduced the number of beds in our hospitals last year. They cut health care, Madam Speaker. And it's the folks working in the emergency room who are left to deal with the aftermath. The PC cuts to health care have an impact on the real lives of patients in our province, and they need to stop. Will the Premier tell the House why she cut 28 beds from Winnipeg hospitals last year? The Honourable First Minister. Well, again, the litany of false accusations continues on the part of the Leader of the Opposition, uh, Madam Speaker. We know that we have uh, more capacity within our ICUs now than we've had in the past, Madam Speaker. But we also recognize that there's a significant challenge, not just here in Manitoba, but right across our country uh, with respect to a shortage of health care workers, particularly nurses, Madam Speaker. And, uh, and, and I know that, uh, again, I will be working with my counterparts across the country and the federal government to ensure that we get more. Uh, immigration is a very important issue. We want, we want to bring more people to our country, more people to our province who are trained uh, health care professionals. We have our internationally educated nurses that are here that we want to get the credentials that they need to get them working on the front line. We've announced 400 more seats and uh, nursing seats in the province of Manitoba. We are taking action. We've been listening, we've been hearing from Manitobans, and we're taking action on their behalf, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Thompson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, Northern re residents who need health care are being transported hundreds of miles away from their home. A concerned daughter contacted me yesterday to explain that their mother was being transported from Thompson General Hospital to Flin Flon because there are no beds available at TGH. This senior will be away from family, friends and loved one just to seek health care. This is a disgraceful way to treat seniors who need health care. Why is the minister not ensuring care close to home? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for Thompson for raising the question. It gives me an opportunity to state that our government has given $4.3 million for 37 additional nurse training seats at the University College of the North. In addition to that, Madam Speaker, we have committed in Budget 2022 $812 million to ensure that rural and northern communities, individuals in those communities, begin to receive care closer to home. We're going to create a northern intermediary hub and so much more to ensure that individuals such as the, the person that the member has, has raised here gets the care that they need in their community. The Honourable Member for Thompson on a supplementary question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I've sent the Minister uh, details of this case, but the circumstances have been the same for so many Manitobans. People are being transferred many hours away from home, away from their family, their friends, their loved ones, their communities. This is such an undignified way to treat seniors. I ask again the Minister, why won't she ensure care close to home? Yep. That's it. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I was pleased uh, earlier this summer to be in Thompson at a table with over 30 stakeholders from Northern Region. We met in Thompson talking about the needs, not just of that community, but other Northern communities. I was in Norway House this uh, just last week as well, talking with 
stakeholders about the needs. We are taking action, Madam Speaker. I know the member for Point Douglas is, is asking me to put on the record again $812 million for the Clinical Preventative Services Plan, which will create a northern intermediary hub. We are committed as a government to providing care in the north and to individuals in rural communities as well, closer to home. The Honourable Member for Thompson on a final supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this year hundreds of people were transfer trans transferred all over the province because there was no beds for them. We saw today that the government has cut available beds in the city of Winnipeg. Our communities need care close to home when needed. Instead, seniors are being transported hundreds of miles away just to seek the care they need. When will the minister ensure that seniors can get care in their communities when they need it? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to highlight that the $812 million will build and expand 38 health care facilities across rural and northern Manitoba. Improve access, quality, and reliability of care, reduce our wait times, increase our nursing staff, improve diagnostic emergency medical services and patient transport, create new hospital beds and personal care home beds, so much more, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased that we have Manitoba's chiefs, grand chiefs, stakeholders all across the north at the table of solutions, Madam Speaker. What is their solution? They have no plan. No plan. The Honourable Member for St. James. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Premier, alongside her predecessor, Brian Pallister, spent nearly $2.5 million on the Brad Wall Report. The Brad Wall Report that infamously covered up $5 billion in Manitoba Hydro revenue. This report included 51 recommendations for Manitoba Hydro, which called for all manner of privatization, contracting out, and P3s. Manitobans want to know if this government plans on moving forward with the recommendations in that document. Can the Premier confirm whether her government will implement all of the Brad Wall Report's recommendations? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, we on this side are somewhat puzzled by the member's tone and, and a seeming uh, defiance or unwillingness to accept uh, this expert report on kiosk and buy for. <laughs> 51 recommendations, two years of work. And of course the NDP is nervous about what this report would say. Because what the report indicates is that Manitobans in future must have protections when an NDP government tries to build assets for $5 billion in addition to the stated cost of the project and then hide those costs from Manitobans. We will act in the best interest of Manitobans where they never did. The Honourable Member for St. James on a supplementary question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This government paid Bradwall nearly $2.5 million to tell them exactly what they wanted to hear. And just like this government, he ignored the evidence to get the outcome he wanted as well. Surprise, surprise, he recommended that Manitoba Hydro pursue privatization, public-private partnerships, and that they contract out services, all while conveniently failing to mention $5 billion in revenue. Manitobans deserve to know whether this government is still planning on following these recommendations. Can the Premier confirm whether she will implement all of the, all of the 51 recommendations from the Brad Wall Report? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, it's no wonder that this member and his party has uh, concerns about this expert report on kiosk and bipole. 
because this is the report that after two years of work details not just the cost overruns by the NDP, but the fact that they hid these increasing costs from Manitobans, that they bungled the capital project, that they overpaid suppliers, and they provided no information to Manitobans about how they were failing. So no wonder they will be afraid of those recommendations. We will act in the best interest of all Manitobans to make sure what the, that what they did on Kiosk never happens again. Yeah. Order. The Honourable Member for St. James on a final supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We are deeply concerned about this report because this report explicitly stated that Hydro should sell off non-core assets. That should be a deep concern to every member on this side of this chamber. This government directed Manitoba Hydro to implement all of the 51 recommendations laid out in the Brad Wall report. The same report that covered up $5 billion in Manitoba Hydro revenue and the same report that stated Hydro should sell off non-core assets. It's clear that this report is deeply flawed and so are its recommendations. The Premier should direct Manitoba Hydro to abandon all the recommendations in this report. Can the Premier clarify whether she will rescind the directive to Manitoba Hydro to implement all 51 recommendations? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Yeah, the member admits that he's afraid of the expert report on kiosk and bipole, and it's no wonder, because what that two-year body of work does is reveal uh, the mistakes and the misguided actions of the NDP. As a matter of fact, one of those misguided actions was to circumvent the actual planning processes through the PUB and the Clean Environment Commission that were supposed to be fundamental processes that would guide the development of such assets. They went around it. They hid from Manitobans. They hid the cost. It has resulted in billions of dollars of overage that Manitobans now bear the cost of. Where they failed, this export report will help to pa pave a path to a future where this never happens again. Yeah. Order. The Honourable Member for Fort Gary. Madam Speaker, Brian Pallister might be gone, but his agenda remains. In the past year, commitments for health capital were underspent by $162 million. That means promised projects for our hospitals and our clinics didn't happen. Over the last six years, altogether, they've underspent by over $800 million. Why does this government continue to copy Brian Pallister and not deliver for Manitobans? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want Manitobans to know that it's shameful, Madam Speaker, to hear what the Leader of the Opposition and the MLA for St. John's have said in this chamber about Manitoba foundations, especially, Madam Speaker, when they both supported and praised the Children's Hospital Foundation recently. Just yesterday on the floor of this House, members opposite were telling Manitobans that the ideas that come forward from foundations, that the supports that come along with those projects from governments and from, from our government and from Manitobans is going against the public health care system. Meanwhile, in the media, they're praising the good work that's been done by the, by the foundations. Again, Madam Speaker, shameful. They would rather this see projects time has fail. expired. Order. The Honourable Member for Fort Gary on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, health care in Manitoba is not a charity, and this government has to stop acting like it is. Health care capital has been underspent each and every year. In 2017, 78 million. 2018, 197 million. 2019, 109 million. 2020, 74 million. 2021, 106 million. And now, for the year ending this April, 162 million. By their own admission, this government is not delivering. 
Hospitals aren't getting timely upgrades because this government won't spend what they have promised. Why is this government carrying on the same approach as Brian Pallister? Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Second day in a row in the chamber, the members opposite have said no to Manitoba projects that would assist Manitobans to receive the care they need. Two, perhaps they should talk to their two former premiers. Members opposite would do well to remember their own history on community contributions. Gary Dewar in 2002, $11 million, Madam Speaker, for Victoria Hospital. Greg Selinger, 2013, for St. Anne's Hospital, $14 million. That's $25 million total for those two projects that they partnered with foundations to complete. If the members opposite want us to complete projects, they have to support foundations in the work of those projects. Order. Honourable Member for Fort Gary on a final supplementary. $800 million, Madam Speaker. That's the health capital that's gone unspent over the past six years. They cancelled the expansion of cancer care. They closed emergency rooms, urgent care centre and a quick care clinic. They closed primary care clinics and the mature women's centre. They closed cancer care locations at both Seven Oaks and Concordia. All this government can do is cut even underspending their own commitments by hundreds of millions of dollars. Why is this government operating under Brian Pallister's playbook? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Under, under the NDP, we would have fewer capital projects because they're going to disband. And, and discontinue foundations. Madam Speaker, in, in, in our budget, $32 million to enhance Order. 23 additional beds at Steinbach Bethesda Hospital, $64.4 million to enhance and add 24 beds at Boundary Trails, $31.6 million to enhance and add 30 additional beds at the Selkirk Regional Health Centre, $5 million for new ER in Dauphin, $10.8 million to enhance and add 12 additional beds at the Lakeshore General Hospital in Ashern. Madam Speaker, those are capital projects we will deliver on. Here. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Madam Speaker, home care workers play an essential role in our health care system. Thousands of Manitobans rely on home care for their daily needs. Yet this government has refused to compensate home care workers fairly. To make matters worse, the money they're paid for mileage has failed to keep pace with rising gas prices. Workers are being forced to pay out of pocket for gas, which is essentially a cut in their pay. Will the minister do the right thing and commit to increasing mileage rates for home care workers today? The Honourable Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and certainly I agree with the member in regards to uh, uh, the important role that uh, health uh, care or uh, home care workers play in. <coughs> excuse, excuse me play in the province of Manitoba and certainly support our seniors. Uh, as I uh, had indicated in the House on many occasions, uh, we and uh, our department are undertaking a seniors uh, uh, strategy review and uh, we look forward to continuing uh, to address the needs of seniors through home care. Sure. It's on our agenda, it's on our radar and I can assure you we will be addressing the needs of our seniors. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame on a, on a supplementary question. 
Home care helps Manitobans age in place and keeps us out of personal care homes and hospitals. Yet home care workers are severely underpaid. They suffer from poor working conditions and poor benefits. And this has led to predictable issues with recruitment and retention. High vacancy rates have led to three WRHA locations, 640 Main Street, 755 Portage, and 80 Sutherland, cancelling all non-essential home care visits. Non-essential services include bathing, laundry, housekeeping, and bulk meal preparation. These are services that people rely on every day for their needs. This government needs to take action to ensure that Manitobans are getting the home care they need. Will the minister do so today? The Honorable Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I do appreciate the uh, issue that uh, the member brings up, and that's why uh, my department is undertaking a, uh, a seniors uh, 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 review, and uh, we will continue to uh, ensure that we are going to fulfill the needs of seniors. Uh, that's the reason for the study. That's why we've reached out to stakeholders. That's why we've reached out to seniors. We are looking for solutions, and we're going to get those solutions. You're here. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame on a final supplementary. The quantity and the quality of home care services has decreased under this government across every corner of our province. It's a shame because Manitoba's home care system used to be the envy of other jurisdictions. High vacancy rates in all areas have resulted in widespread appointment cancellations that impacts the quality of care provided. This is wrong, Madam Speaker. Manitobans want to age in place, yet many are being forced into personal care homes and hospitals due to the lack of home care services. The government should take action to provide supports for Manitobans to age in place. Will they do so today? The Honourable Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I agree with the member. Uh, what, what I've heard time and time again from the stakeholders that I've been dealing with, and certainly seniors themselves, is that they want to age at home. And this government is looking to ensure that we are able to accommodate that. And again, that's what the whole senior strategy is about. And I can assure the member, I'm, as soon as I'm able to share our initiatives with this House, I will be doing it, and we will be addressing those needs. Good job. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For decades, this province has had the tragic distinction of its mistreatment of women, especially Indigenous women. It's been called ground zero for missing and murdered. While we use passive terms like domestic violence, we sidestep the issue. It is overwhelmingly violence committed by men against women, girls, and two-spirited who end up murdered and missing. It's been this way for decades and more, and there's still no place for many women to get safe. I table an article from the Globe and Mail from 2012, a decade ago, when the Manitoba NDP refused to even consider calling an inquiry into the MMIWG. On this day of action, will the PC government do what the NDP refused to do to call a provincial inquiry into the murdered, missing and murdered in, in <coughs> Indigenous women and girls in Manitoba? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. We know when this government has recognized, and I think that all members in this House recognize the tragedy when it comes to murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. Certainly from the Department of Justice perspective, working with victim services, I know from the Minister uh, of Families and the legislation that she's brought in, whether it's Claire's Law or others dealing with human trafficking, Madam Speaker, there are significant efforts that are taking place when it comes to this government, and there are more efforts that are going to continue to take place. We're looking at all different things that we can do, working with federal partners and others internationally as well to try to ensure that there is justice brought where there needs to be justice, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface on a supplementary question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We know there is a link between children taken into the CFS system and people who end up murdered or missing and who end up being trafficked. We all get the reports from inquiries and from Phoenix Sinclair, the children's advocate. Yet, when Phoenix Sinclair died, the NDP dragged their feet on calling an inquiry for years, 
doubled the number of children in the custody of CFS and violated their human rights by taking their special allowance. They actively campaigned to put more Indigenous children in jail by backing the Harper Conservatives' draconian omnibus crime bill while boasting of the new prisons they were building. Will the PC government call a provincial inquiry into MMIWG and consider the failures of systemic racism of the CFS system in fueling this crisis? The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And while the member's opposite continues to play politics with the lives of children in care, I'd like to share with him something constructive that he can do. He can come into this House and he can vote in favour of Bill 40. Bill 40 is a tool that will give everyone in Manitoba, particularly law enforcement and children, uh, CFS agencies, tools to protect children from exploitation. This is a bill that is brought forward after much consultation with the community on how we can help protect children from sexual exploitation and from predators in this community. So if he wants to do something constructive, I would urge him to read that legislation and vote in favour of it. Yeah. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Manitoba still has one of the highest rates of violence against women and girls in Canada. Back in 2021, the federal government released the findings of its inquiry into MMIWG in partnership with the provinces, and it demonstrated the importance of our province needing to work in cooperation with CFS, our children's advocate, businesses and nonprofits helping to combat violence against women. In addition to implementing the 2021 National Action Plan, what has this government done to ensure that when MMIWG2S people bring their experiences forward, that their statements are respected, believed and acted upon immediately? The Honourable Minister of Families. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate the members' advocacy, especially on this day, a national day of recognition and awareness into murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. And our government is take, takes the issue very seriously. That is why we are moving forward with the implementation of many of those calls to, to action. That is why our government had introduced Bill 44, otherwise known as Claire's Law, which Diane Redsky had said was a very significant response to two of the calls uh, for action in that report. Claire's Law will help bring protect protection for uh, particularly vulnerable women and girls in the province. And I'd ask that member uh, to support that bill when it comes to this floor for debate and a vote. The Honourable Member for Dauphin. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Without culturally appropriate supports, Youth who are involved in the justice system are often at risk of reoffending in our communities. Can the Minister of Justice please share with the House how our government is committed to improving the lives of our youth in and out of the justice system? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to thank my friend for that question. I was pleased to join the Premier, the Minister of Indigenous Relations, and the Minister of Families at Marymount yesterday to announce a new program for 45 Indigenous youth who are involved in the justice system. It will help youth in Winnipeg and in the city of Thompson. It will provide a high-intensity, wraparound, culturally-based program for those youth. That programming is very important, Madam Speaker, because we know that if doing time is wasted time, then ultimately it's repeat time, Madam Speaker. I want to thank Mary Mound and all those who are involved. I understand why the NDP won't ask any questions about justice, because they see we have a plan and they have no plan, Madam Speaker. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Concordia. Madam Speaker, tragedy struck last weekend when motorcyclist Denis LaRue was killed in a collision on Highway 311. Denis was celebrating his 45th birthday on a charity ride alongside friends and family. The group hit a patch of mud on Highway 311, which led to them losing control of their motorcycles and to the tragic accident. Denis' friends and family are calling on this government to increase highway safety by clearing roads quick, more quickly and by investing in signage. Can the minister tell us what he's doing to address highway safety? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank the member for the question. Madam Speaker, my condolences goes out to the family of uh, Danny LaRue that uh, was a lot, his lot, life was lost with a tragedy when it came to a, 
uh, condition of the road when it came to you know the agriculture industry out there. Um, when it come, uh, it was really tragic, and I know the motorcycle um, family that he actually shared was is uh, in grieving at this point too, man. Speaker. So my condolences from our department goes out to the to the uh, the uh, actual person who lost his life. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Concordia on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, Denis was described by loved ones as a man with a big heart. On the day that he died, he was riding to raise funds for a local animal shelter. We owe it to Denis and to make sure that Manitoba's highways are safe for everyone. Advocates are calling for highways to be cleared more quickly and for signage to be deployed very quickly to prevent further tragic accidents. Does the minister have plans to implement these asks? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, I want to thank the member for the question. Madam Speaker, I know our department is looking at um, all the situations that happened that, that weekend. And I know we are looking at a pilot project that Ontario is putting forward to when it comes to uh, situations when it comes to highways, when there is actually uh, um, when, when, when mud and, and debris gets on highways, we want to make sure that we're looking at and we, and, and we want our, again, justice to, uh, to investigate the situation, to make sure that um, the investigation is done, to make sure that, you know, when it comes to any kind of fine, uh, fines, uh, we are going to be implementing um, appropriate uh, in a situation like this, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Concordia on a final supplementary. Madam Speaker, highway safety is something that all Manitobans can get behind. One death on our roads is too many. Safety as advocates are asking us for concrete steps and for action now to be taken. But we know that cuts have consequences. And with the high vacancy rate throughout the department, staff struggle just to keep up with the very basics of highway safety in this province. Yep. How will the minister implement plans on taking action to improve highway safety in this province immediately? Good question. The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Speaker. M Madam Speaker, safety is the number one concern when it comes to our department. We are investing $1.5 billion to making sure that our highways are in great, uh, good conditions. We are investing in everywhere in the province, including Highway 6, what the, uh, the member always comes up for. We are looking at um, also looking at maintenance contracts with, with municipalities. We are looking at making sure recruitment is up there to making sure that our highways are safe. Madam Speaker, that is our number one um, Priority is our uh, safety in our highways, Madam Speaker. The time for oral questions has expired. Petitions. The Honourable Member for Transcona. Madam Speaker, I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. To the background to this petition is Order. Followed. The Bibliotheque Regional Jolie has been served. Notice by the Red River Valley School Division to vacate the premises currently situated in the auditorium at the Cole Heritage School by March 31, 2023. The auditorium was originally built in the 1960s by renowned Manitoba architect Etienne Gabaret and has been home to the JRL for 48 years. Number three, a photo of the auditorium captured in the regional library is published in a 2008 document titled Heritage Buildings in the RM of Salaberry and St. Pierre Jolie. It is marked as an important modern building that could attain the status of heritage site. The JRL and Red River Valley School Division have flourished from a mutually beneficial memorandum of understanding for 54 years. Their shared collection boasts over 50,000 books and is the fourth largest collection of French language literature in rural Manitoba. Students that are bused in from the neighboring municipalities that do not have a public library, such as Niverville, Grunthal, and Cleefield, are provided with free access to the public library and its fourth largest collection of French books in rural Manitoba during the school year. We petition a Legislative Assembly in Manitoba as follows. Number one, to request the Minister of Labor, Consumer Protection, and Government Services to consider granting the auditorium to the JRL by March 1, 
2023. Number two, to request the Minister of Education to recognize the value of, that the JRL provides to the student population of EHS, as well as the communities of the village de saint pierre Jolie and the RM of the Salaberry. Number three, to request the Minister of Education and the Minister of Francophone Affairs to recognize that an MOU between the Red River Valley School Division and the JRL is mutually, financially, and culturally beneficial. Number four, to request the Minister of Sport, Culture, and Heritage to recognize the heritage potential of this important building and its status in the community. And number five, to request the Minister of Sport, Culture, and Heritage to prevent any renovations to the auditorium that would destroy and devaluate the architectural integrity of the building. And this petition, Madam Speaker, is signed by many Manitobans. Thank many. you. In accordance with our Rule 132, bracket 6, when petitions are read, they are deemed to be received by the House. Honourable Member for Concordia. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly, and the background to this petition is as follows. Number one, residents of the River Park South community in Winnipeg are disturbed by the increasing noise levels caused by traffic on the South Perimeter Highway. Number two, the South Perimeter Highway functions as a transport route for semi-trucks traveling across Canada, making this stretch of the perimeter especially loud. Number three, according to the South Perimeter Noise Study conducted in 2019, the traffic levels are expected to increase significantly over the next 20 years, and background backyard noise levels have already surpassed 65 decibels. Number four, Seniac Road, which runs along the south perimeter, contributes additional truck traffic, causing increased noise and air pollution. Number five, residents face a decade of construction on the south perimeter, making this an appropriate time to add noise mitigation for south perimeter to these projects. Number six, the current barriers between the south perimeter highway and the homes of the River Park South residents are a berm and a wooden fence, neither of which are effective in reducing the traffic noise. We petition. The Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows. Number one, to urge the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure to consult with noise specialists and other experts to help them determine the most effective way to reduce the traffic noise and to commit to meaningful action to address resident concern. And number two, to urge the Minister of Transportation to help address this issue with a noise barrier wall along residential portions of the south perimeter from St. Anne's Road to St. Mary's Road and for River Park South residents. And this petition, Madam Speaker, is signed by many Manitobans. The Honourable Member for the Paul Kamisak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this position is as follows. Number one. The Provincial Road number 224 serves Pegwas First Nation, Fisher River Cree Nation, and surrounding communities. The road is in need of substantial repairs. Number two, the road has been in poor condition for years and has numerous potholes, uneven driving services, and extremely narrow shoulders. Number three, due to recent population growth in the area, there has been increased vehicle and pedestrian use of Provincial Road 224. Number four, without repair, Provincial Road 224 will continue to pose a hazard to the many Manitobans who use it regularly. Number five, concerned Manitobans are requesting that Provincial Road 224 be assessed and repaired urgently to, to improve safety for its users. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows, to urge the Minister of Infrastructure to complete an assessment of Provincial Road 224 and implement the appropriate repairs using public funds as quickly as possible. This petition has been signed by many, many fine Manitobans. I go the Honourable Member for Elmwood. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background of this petition is as follows. Number one. Over 25,000 vehicles per day cross the Louise Bridge, which has served as a vital link for vehicular traffic between Northeast Winnipeg and downtown for the last 110 years. Number two, current structure will undoubtedly be declared unsafe in a few years as it has deteriorated extensively, becoming functionally obsolete 
subject to more frequent unplanned repairs and cannot be widened to accommodate future traffic capacity. Number three, as far back as 2008, the City of Winnipeg has studied where the new replacement bridge should be situated. Number four, after including the bridge replacement in the City's five-year capital budget forecast in 2009, the new bridge became a short-term construction priority in the City's Transportation Master Plan of 2011. Number five, City capital and budget plans identified replacement of the Louise Bridge on a site just east of the bridge and expropriated homes there on the south side of Naren Avenue in anticipation of a 2015 start. Number six, in 2014, the new city administration did not make use of available federal infrastructure funds. Number seven, the new Louise Bridge Committee began its campaign to demand a new bridge and its surveys confirmed residents wanted a new bridge beside the current bridge with the old bridge kept open for local traffic. Number eight, the NDP provincial government signaled its firm commitment to partner with the city on replacing the Louise Bridge in its 2015 throne speech. Unfortunately, provincial infrastructure initiatives such as the New Louise Bridge came to a halt with the election of the Progressive Conservative Government in 2016. Number nine, more recently the city te tethered the Louise Bridge replacement issue to its new transportation master plan and Eastern Corridor project. Its recommendations have now identified the location of the Lu New Louise Bridge to be placed just to the west of the current bridge not to the east as originally proposed. The city expropriation process has begun. Number 10, the new premier has a duty to direct the provincial government to provide financial assistance to the city so it can complete this long overdue vital link to Northeast Winnipeg and Transcona. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows to urge, number one, to urge the new premier to financially assist the city of Winnipeg on building this three-lane bridge in each direction to maintain this vital link between Northeast Winnipeg, Transcona, and the downtown. Number two, to urge the provincial government to recommend that the city of Winnipeg keep the old bridge fully open to traffic while the new bridge is under construction. Number three, to urge the provincial government to consider the feasibility of keeping it open for active transportation in the future. And this petition is signed by many, many Manitobans. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Now, uh, I ask leave to present the following petition to the legislature. Uh, the member does not need leave to present a petition. Go on. I am presenting, I wish to present the following petition to the Manitoba legislature. The background to this petition is as follows. <clears throat> A hearing aid is a battery-powered electronic device designed to improve an individual's ability to perceive sound. Worn in or behind a person's ear, they make sounds louder, helping people hear better when it's quiet and when it's noisy. People who suffer hearing loss, whether due to aging, illness, employment, or accident, not only lose the ability to communicate effectively with friends, family, or colleagues, they also can experience unemployment, social isolation, and struggles with mental health. Hearing loss can also impact the safety of an individual with hearing loss as it affects the ability to hear cars coming, safety alarms, call 911, etc. A global commission on the state of the research for dementia care and prevention released an updated consensus report in July 2020 identifying 12 key risk factors for dementia and cognitive decline. The strongest risk factor that was indicated was hearing loss. It was calculated that up to 8% of the total number of dementia cases could potentially be avoided with management of hearing loss. Hearing aids are therefore essential to the mental health and well-being of Manitobans, especially to those at significant risk of dementia, Alzheimer's, a disorder of the brain affecting cognition in the ever-growing senior population. Audiologists are healthcare professionals who help patients decide which kind of hearing aid will work best for them based on the type of hearing loss, patient's age, and ability to manage small devices, lifestyle, and ability to afford. The cost of hearing aids can be prohibitive to many Manitobans depending on their income and circumstances. 
Hearing aids cost on average $995 to $4,000 per ear, and many professionals say the hearing aids only work at their best for five years. Manitoba residents under the age of 18 who require a hearing aid as prescribed by an otolaryngologist or audiologist will receive either an 80% reimbursement from Manitoba Health of a fixed amount for an analog device, up to a maximum of $500 per ear, or 80% of a fixed amount for a digital or analog programmable device, up to a maximum of $1,800. However, this reimbursement is not available to Manitobans who need the device who are over the age of 18, which will result in financial hardship for many young people entering the workforce, students and families. In addition, seniors representing 14.3% of Manitoba's population are not eligible for reimbursement despite being the group most likely in need of a hearing aid. Most insurance companies only provide a minimal partial cost of a hearing aid, and many Manitobans, especially retired persons, old aid pensioners, and other low-income earners do not have access to health insurance plans. The province of Quebec's hearing devices program covers all costs related to hearing aids and assistive listening devices, including the purchase, repair, and replacement. Alberta offers subsidies to all seniors, 65 and over, and low-income adults once every five years. New Brunswick provides coverage for the purchase and maintenance not covered by other agencies or private health insurance plans, as well as assistance for those for whom the purchase would cause financial hardship. Manitobans over age 18 are only eligible for support for hearing aids if they are receiving employment and income assistance, and the reimbursement only provides a maximum of $500 an year. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows to urge the provincial government to consider hearing loss as a medical treatment under Manitoba Health, to urge the provincial government to provide income-based coverage for hearing aids to all who need them, as hearing has been proven to be essential to Manitoba's cognitive, mental, and social health and well-being. Signed by Kay Little, Carol Ackerman, Sandy Chase, and many others. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Madame la Présidente, je désire présenter la pétition suivante à l'Assemblée législative. L'Assemblée législative du Manitoba. Le contexte de cette pétition est le suivant. 1. La Bibliothèque régionale Jolie Regional Library, GBRG, a été avisée par la division scolaire Vallée de la Rivière Rouge, DSBRR, de libérer les locaux actuellement situés dans l'auditorium de l'école Heritage School, EHS, d'ici le 31 mars 2023. 2. Le Dottorium a été construit dans les années 1960 par le célèbre architecte manitobain Étienne Gabory et BRG y est installé depuis 48 ans. 3. Une photo de l'Auditorium intitulée « La Bibliothèque régionale » est publiée dans un document de 2008, intitulé « Bâtiments patrimoniaux des MR de Salaberry et saint pierre joly Il est indiqué qu'il s'agit d'un bâtiment moderne important qui pourrait atteindre le statut de site patrimonial. 4. BRG et DSVRR ont prospéré grâce à un protocole d'entente mutuellement bénéfique pendant 54 ans. 5. Leur collection commune compte plus de 50 000 livres et possède la quatrième plus grande collection de littérature de langue française dans les régions rurales du Manitoba. 6. Les élèves qui sont transportés par autobus des municipalités voisines qui n'ont pas de bibliothèque publique comme Neverville, Grenfell et Creefield ont accès gratuitement à la bibliothèque publique à sa quatrième plus grande collection de livres en français dans les régions rurales du Manitoba pendant l'année scolaire. Nous présentons la, à l'Assemblée législative du Manitoba la pétition suivante. 1. De demander au ministre du Travail de la protection des consommateurs et des services gouvernementaux d'envisager de concéder l'auditorium à la BRG d'ici le 1er mars 2023. 2. De demander au ministre de l'Éducation de reconnaître la valeur que la BRG apporte à la population étudiante de l'EHS 
ainsi qu'aux communautés de villages de saint pierre joly et de la MR de Salaberry. 3. Demandez au ministre de l'Éducation et au ministre des Affaires francophones de reconnaître qu'un protocole d'entente entre le RRVSD et GRL est mutuellement bénéfique financièrement et culturellement. 4. Demandez au ministre des Sports, de la Culture et du Patrimoine de reconnaître le potentiel patrimonial de cet important bâtiment et son statut au sein de la communauté. 5. Demandez au ministre des Sports, de la Culture et du Patrimoine d'empêcher toute rénovation de l'auditorium qui détruirait et dévaloriserait l'intégrité architecturale du bâtiment. Cette pétition est signée par Michelle Bouchard, Richard Marion, Henry Marion et plusieurs de Manitoba. Grievances? Orders of the day, the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I'd like to announce that the Standing Committee on Social and Economic Development will meet on Thursday, October 6, 2022, and if necessary, on Tuesday, October 11, 2022, at 6 p.m., to consider Bill Number 36, the Manitoba Hydro Amendment and Public Utilities Board Amendment Act. It has been announced that the Standing Committee on Social and Economic Development We'll meet on Thursday, October 6, 2022, and if necessary, on Tuesday, October 11, 2022, at 6 p.m., to consider Bill Number 36, the Manitoba Hydro Amendment and Public Utilities Board Amendment Act. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you again, Madam Speaker. Pursuant to Rule 34, bracket 11, I'm announcing that the private member's resolution to be considered on the next Tuesday of private member's business will be the one put forward by the Honourable Member for St. Boniface. The title of the resolution is calling on the Legislative Assembly to urge the federal government to ensure health care funding equity for Manitoba. It has been announced that the private member's resolution to be considered on the next Tuesday of private member's business will be one put forward by the Honourable Member for St. Boniface. The title of the resolution is calling on the Legislative Assembly to urge the federal government to ensure health funding equity for Manitoba. The Honourable Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, could you please resolve the House and the Committee of Supply? It has been announced that the House will consider estimates this afternoon. The House will now resolve into Committee of Supply. Mr. Deputy Speaker, please take the chair.
Will the Committee of Supply please come to order? This section of the Committee of Supply will now resume consideration of the estimates of Executive Council. At this time, we invite ministerial and opposition staff to enter the chamber, and we ask the members to please introduce their staff in attendance. Uh, would either member like to introduce their staff? As previously stated in accordance with Subrule 77, subsection 16, during the consideration of departmental estimates, questioning for each department shall proceed in a global manner. Honorable First Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll just introduce my staff. I have with us today Don Leach, the Clerk of Executive Council, and Philip Hood, the uh, Chief of Staff. The floor is open for questions. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. And the Tories' worst nightmare is currently monitoring a scrum, so he will join us shortly. Uh, I wanted to just ask the uh, Premier about um, what's taking place uh, outside uh, at the moment. There's, um, I guess, uh, you know, Winnipeg police service members and uh, correction officers are sort of, uh, it appears, taking down the uh, protest camp out the front. So I was just wondering if the Premier could uh, share what she's able to about what's taking place. The Honourable First Minister. Thank you very much, and I, I thank the uh, Leader of the Opposition for the question. Before I, I get into that, I did want to, yesterday the Leader of the Opposition ended off on uh, uh, speaking about uh, Lake Saint, the Lake St. Martin outlet, and I just wanted to offer some, some clarification there uh, in response to his uh, statement that he made just right at the end of the day. Uh, I did uh, indicate to the Leader of the Opposition, of course, we have signed off on our part of the Lake St. Martin outlet. Um, again, the uh, ministers are out uh, and have been out uh, for quite some time um, and engaging uh, with local communities as well um, and First Nation communities. Um, I think it's important to reiterate the fact that um, this is going through a federal environmental process right now. And uh, until that process com is completed and the licensing um, is completed as well, the federal government will not sign off on this. So this is in the hands of the federal government. Now, the leader of the opposition uh, said, you know, why are we not uh, pushing this along? Well, again, we've done what we can on our side, but I will say to the leader of the opposition as well that in my first face-to-face -face meeting with the prime minister, uh, just prior to the flooding um, in the spring, uh, I did bring, I did raise this issue as a as a very important issue and urged him uh, and the government to to move along. And so, uh, and I know that uh, our ministers have also been in touch with uh, the ministers as well, uh, the federal their federal counterparts to do the same. So I I did just want to take an opportunity to get that on the record. Uh, just so that uh, the Leader of the Opposition and Manitobans are aware that this is in the hands of the federal government and we have in fact done our urging uh, to move it along uh, for some time now. 
Uh, with respect to um, the leader of the opposition's uh, question, um, this uh, obviously we want to do what is in the best interest of the safety, we, all of our staff um, and MLAs and others work out of this building. Uh, we have members of the public coming from outside. We've got school children coming uh, to the building here at the Manitoba Legislature uh, for tours and to visit and to learn and to understand more about this uh, democratic institution, which we want to be able to offer them that, that opportunity uh, moving forward, especially after having been shut down for, for some time uh, during COVID, uh, again, out of the safety of, of Manitobans. But we want to ensure uh, the safety of all Manitobans coming and going from this building. It is open to the public, but it's also a workplace. And so we want to ensure that it is a safe workplace for, for those who who work here uh, as well. And so, uh, again, what is going on right now in terms of um, what is happening on the grounds of the legislature is under the purview, I believe, of the Winnipeg Police Service. So um, I, I, I don't get involved, and certainly our government does not get involved in, in how the police um, conduct um, you know, their operations. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition will know that, so I won't uh, weigh into that um, uh, at this point in time. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, appreciate the uh, information shared there by the First Minister. Uh, and just uh, by way of a follow-up, I'd ask if there's, you know, um, information that uh, can be shared about what brought this on, like why was today selected or why is this happening now? The Honourable First Minister. Yeah, again, the operations of uh, the Winnipeg Police Service are under their purview and under the um, the purview of, of the Chief of Police, and um, we, you know, they that's uh, we leave that. They're the experts in this field, and and uh, we leave that the operations up up to them. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, I was uh, wanting to speak about health care, uh, moving to a, a different topic, and just begin by asking uh, whether the Premier uh, plans to continue with the uh, Manitoba Clinical and Preventative Services Plan. The Honourable First Minister. Uh, thank the Leader of the Opposition for that question. Of course, that is a question that uh, should come out of the um, estimates of uh, health which I believe is ongoing uh, right now, and those questions can be asked in, in that uh, estimates. Uh, those decisions are, are made there in conjunction with, um, with those, uh, uh, with shared health and uh, with the RHAs. And um, so for the operations of the government, that's where uh, those questions will be best asked. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Just, uh, you know, given that the Premier is the former Minister of Health, wanted to know whether she plans to continue with the Manitoba Clinical and Preventive Services Plan, which she would be familiar with as Minister and would be aware of as the First Minister. Is that going to continue? The Honourable First Minister. I think what will continue, obviously, is that uh, we will continue to work with um, stakeholders in health to ensure that we provide better health care closer to home uh, for Manitobans. We have said that for a number of years. We continue to, to stand by that. Uh, and we will continue to take actions to ensure that uh, Manitobans from wherever they are in this great province of ours, whether it's northern Manitoba or rural Manitoba, east, west, or in the city of Winnipeg, it's access to those health care services that they need when they need them. And again, those are discussions that take place um, in the Department of Health along with uh, Shared Health and the RHAs in terms of uh, the implementation of, of those strategies. and. Uh, I think, again, that would be most uh, appropriately asked in the Department of Health estimates. The, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
the first wave of the clinical and preventive services plan uh, saw the closures of the emergency rooms at Concordia, Victoria General Hospital, and Seven Oaks. Does the Premier believe it was correct to close those emergency rooms? The Honourable First Minister. Well, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Of course, um, what we want to do is ensure that Manitobans get access to the services that they need when they need them. And part of that was um, obviously a restructuring of things to ensure that um, patients were not moved from one um, building to another across the city to get if they needed an MRI or a, a CT scan, they, they're now able to get it right in where, where, where they are hospitalized uh, and in the emergency room that, the, that they go to. And so it's very important to have access to all of those services right there uh, in those buildings. And that, of course, is, is part of that plan uh, to ensure that there's easier, more efficient and effective access um, to the diagnostic uh, services and the surgical services uh, needed um, at these at these hospitals. So um, that certainly was a, a discussion at the time. There's also, you know, uh, there's also a need for um, you know a, a, a discrepancy between what is emergency service, what, what are emergent services, and what are urgent services. And so, urgent care is often needed for specific things, uh, broken limbs and stitches and and so on. Those are uh, accessed in an urgent care center. Um, we see this, uh, you know, in other provinces across the country. We see them around the world where people are able to get quicker access to those services and those urgent uh, care centers, um, but don't necessarily need to get the access to those in emergency uh, care centers. And so um, that has helped alleviate uh, some of the pressure. Obviously, through COVID, it's been very, very difficult, Mr. Chair. Um, we know that um, you know we, there's been um, a backlog as a result of, of the pandemic um, in some of those surgical and diagnostic procedures. Again, of the pandemic um, in some of those surgical and diagnostic procedures. Again, that's nothing. Why we took action immediately, listening to Manitobans again, we took action immediately and we set up that uh, surgical and diagnostic task force to, uh, to help reduce the wait times on those surgical and diagnostic procedures. So uh, we think that that's the, the prudent way to go. That, um, and I, I just want to take the opportunity now to thank all of those individuals who sit on that task force who have been working day in and day out. Uh, to ensure that we develop a system that is more efficient and effective to get those surgeries uh, and, and diagnostic procedures to Manitobans when, when they need them. Um, I know the Leader of the Opposition has talked about uh, not wanting to contract out services uh, beyond uh, the existing uh, system. Uh, we think that that would be a mistake. We think that there's thousands of surgeries that are now contracted out uh, there um, and uh, for Manitobans who need those surgical procedures and uh, who need those diagnostic procedures, again, within the single payer system. But, you know, we're looking beyond just the system because we don't have that, that because the, the capacity, we're trying to increase the capacity right now. Uh, beyond the previous uh, capacity to ensure that we can start to chip away at those um, at the backlogs. It's very important. So for those thousands of Manitobans who are looking to get those procedures um, in, in, uh, in this way, it's very important for them to be able to get those procedures. And so uh, again, I want to thank the task force. I want to thank all of those working on our front line. Um, and indeed, with those that we're contracting out services with, with Maple Surgical Center, with Western Surgical, uh, with, uh, with those outside our province as well right now, ideally we would like to be contracting out those services right here in the province of Manitoba and expanding those services um, to ensure that Manitobans have the access that they need uh, to those, those surgical and diagnostic procedures. That's what will help reduce the wait time uh, for Manitobans. That's what, what will help get rid of the backlogs that are existing uh, in surgeries and diagnostics in the province of Manitoba. 
um, and, uh, and we'll continue to do whatever we can. We won't take an ideological approach to this. We'll continue to do uh, what we can to ensure that Manitobans get those surgeries and the diagnostics when they need it. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you kindly, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, privatizing public health care services is an ideological decision. Uh, the first wave of the Clinical and Preventive Services Plan, which the Premier has just endorsed in her uh, previous answer, the first wave of the Clinical and Preventive Services Plan led to the closure of the Misericordia Urgent Care Centre. Does she believe it was correct to close the Misericordia Urgent Health Care Centre? The Honourable First Minister. Well, once again, the Leader of the Opposition continues to put um, in factual information on the record. And uh, uh, But what I will say is that what we are concerned about is ensuring that Manitobans get the procedures that they need when they need them. And we know that there is a backlog in surgeries and uh, diagnostics right now, not just in the province of Manitoba, but across the country. And uh, now is not the time to take an ideological approach. Now is the time to find innovative ways to, uh, to uh, ensure that we deplete those, uh, those backlogs so Manitobans can live uh, the healthy lives that they uh, need, want, and deserve, uh, Mr. Chair. And so that's obviously uh, what we are doing there. Um, what I will say is that some of the actions that were taken again prior to COVID uh, and some of the changes that were taking place, what we, what we started to see just prior to COVID is that the ER wait times were down and reduced significantly as a result of some of those changes. So again, I prefer to look at what is um, getting the best results for Manitobans. Uh, I don't look at it from an ideological or an ideological standpoint. I look at it from a very practical standpoint of wanting to get those services for Manitobans uh, when they need them. And so I'll just point out to, and it is a fact, again, the Leader of the Opposition may not like this, but it is a fact that uh, some of those changes that took place uh, resulted in shorter ER wait times. Uh, at the time. And again, that was prior to the pandemic. Obviously, the pandemic hit and it's been a very challenging thing. Again, not just, you know, for here in Manitoba, but across the country and, and indeed uh, around the world. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, thank you kindly, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the opportunity to just correct the record there. Uh, almost the entirety of what the Premier said there was incorrect. We know that emergency room wait times increased month after month, report after report, from the time that they started, and by they, I mean the Premier's PC cabinet colleagues, led by Brian Pallister, whose name none of them can say, apparently, anymore, even though they all owe their electoral uh, you know, history to him. Um, every single month, those ER wait times went up following the closures of the emergency rooms at Victoria, Concordia, Seven Oaks, and the urgent care at Misericordia. I'm looking at a chart here, and it is very clear that there was an upward trend ticking further and further into a visual illustration of the amount of time spent suffering in an emergency room on the part of Manitobans. Again, fast forward through uh, a couple years of PC mismanagement of both the pandemic and the healthcare system, we know that those ER waits are even longer. Those ER waits are even longer. Concerningly, and this is a concern that I think is echoed by many folks who uh, work in healthcare, the last respiratory illness season prior to COVID is one that saw our healthcare system under considerable strain. And as Manitobans now look ahead to another respiratory illness season, in which we have the additional uh, illness of COVID to contend with relative to that one that we saw in the winter of 2019, 2020, certainly folks are concerned. So again, clear trend. Month after month, report after report, ER wait times increased from the closures which began in 2017 through to 2020. 
things got even worse over the course of the pandemic. And so that's why I asked the Premier if it was correct to close the Misericordia Urgent Health Care Centre, along with the emergency rooms at Concordia, Victoria and Seven Oaks. The Honourable First Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, again, um, false information that uh, the Leader of the Opposition continues to put on the record is, I guess, no surprise to, to Manitobans, but uh, I do recall back in the days of the previous NDP government when um, people, will, people were not just lining the hallways in the emergency rooms, um, Mr. Uh, Chair, they were lining our hallways. They were, it was certainly a, a dark time in, in the history of our province. I remember uh, one uh, Brian Sinclair who waited for 33 hours under their watch uh, in an emergency room and, and died. And uh, we just know that Manitobans don't want to go back to, to those days, uh, those dark days. They were uh, certainly wanting uh, to look at, at challenges and changes that would improve those and that's of course um, what we uh, what we did at the time and and certainly um, you know what we don't want to do is is go back to those those dark days of, of uh, the NDP government I, I will also just um, one of the things that that we learned um, in in the process is that uh, about 40 percent of people who were presenting at emergency rooms uh, would have been better treated in other other areas, um, in other clinics, either walk-in clinics or urgent care centers. And those, you know, the urgent care centers didn't exist under the previous uh, NDP government, and uh, those are things that, that we brought about. And so I, I'm not sure if the leader of the opposition is saying we should get rid of those now. Uh, but I will say that um, that's taken a significant strain off of our emergency room to uh, free up uh, more time for the patients that, that really need that emergent care within our system. And so 
I, I'm hoping the leader of the opposition isn't suggesting that we go back to those uh, those extremely dark days of the previous NDP government, uh, where people were not well well served in the province of Manitoba. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. The Clinical and Preventive Services Plan led to the closure of the Corridon Primary Care Clinic and the St. Boniface Family Medicine Centre. Does the Premier believe it was correct to close these primary care centres? The Honourable First Minister. Well, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you, and uh, I think it's um, imperative at this point in time to remind Manitobans and remind the Leader of the Opposition, members opposite, of the, the times when uh, I believe at, at one point there was a uh, former Premier that promised to end hallway medicine in six months with $15 million, and those were the kind of promises that were made by the previous NDP government. Of course, that never came to fruition at the time. In fact, you know, it went from hallway medicine to highway medicine and things continued to get worse no matter how much more money they put into the system. And so, of course, Manitobans remember those times. Uh, those were dark times and we certainly don't want to go back to those times. 
they, they can remember times, certainly in, in rural Manitoba, where 20 uh, emergency rooms were closed under their watch. Those are the, the dark days of, of the previous NDP government that I think Manitobans don't want to go back to. And certainly, um, when you know the, the leader of the opposition mentioned St. Boniface Hospital, well, um, you know, just recently we announced a, a $141 million um, increase to the St. Boniface or Saint, a new St. Boniface um, Emergency Department, uh, which will, I believe, triple triple the size of it, I, I believe. Um, and that is very significant for, for St. Boniface Hospital, Mr. Chair. Those are things that, that we are doing and that's part of our plan. Again, of course, uh, the leader of the opposition loves to talk about um, you know, various things and put false information on the record about you know, what we're doing, uh, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, but um, I, I would say that uh, the fact of the matter is he has no plan of his own. And I think Manitobans are looking to see what his plan is. What is his plan um, for health care in Manitoba? Because our plan is, is very clear. We're making improvements to um, our health care system. New hospital developments in, in Manitoba are taking place right across this great province of ours. Uh, these are some of the things that uh, that we've announced and that uh, we're working on $185.5 million for a new hospital in, in Nipawa. So again, while they were shutting hospitals down in rural Manitoba, we are looking to um, expand services in rural Manitoba. $5.1 million for a new endoscopy uh, chemotherapy spaces at Dauphin Regional Health Center. Uh, again, uh, something that uh, that we are doing for rural Manitobans when they shut down we are in fact offering more services for Manitobans living uh, right across this great province of ours 45.7 million dollar expansion of the Selkirk Regional Health Center uh, again um, very very positive for uh, the people within that community also uh, a 73.6 million dollar expansion at the Boundary Trails Health Center. Uh, 40.6 million dollar expansion of the Bethesda Regional Health Center. Uh, the list goes on, um, Mr. Mr. Uh, Chair. 331.8 million dollars for a new hospital in, in Portage La Prairie, which will be great for people in, in those surrounding areas to ensure that they have the services that they need and, and the diagnostic and surgical services that they need closer to home and the health care that they need closer to home. Uh, 70 million to enhance health services in Brandon, Mr. Chair, uh, including an addition, an addition uh, and renovations at the Brandon Regional Health Center and expansion and renovation of the Western Manitoba Cancer Center. Again, um, offering cancer care local, uh, closer to, to home within that Westman region, Mr. Chair. $10.8 million for renovation to Ashern's Lakeshore, Lakeshore General Hospital. $115 million in northern Manitoba for an intermediate hub, and, and uh, the list goes on, uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, this is what we are doing for Manitobans. Uh, again, the leader of the opposition can stand up and oppose those things. We think that would be wrong. Uh, but it would be nice if he would let Manitobans know what is his plan for health care in the province of Manitoba. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Chair, my plan is one shared by all my colleagues on the health care side of the House, the NDP side of the House. We plan to fix the damage the PCs have caused to our health care system. It's going to take years to accomplish this goal, seeing as how badly damaged our health care system is today. But we are committed to it, guided by those uh, heroes working on the front lines of our health care system. I'm very optimistic that we will be able to turn things around should we get the chance uh, to govern. Continuing down the extensive list of cuts made by this government, cataloging already the closures of the emergency rooms at Concordia, 
Seven Oaks, Victoria General, the closure of the urgent care at Misericordia, the closure of the clinics on Corridon and at St. Boniface. I'm also reminded of the fact that the first wave of the clinical and preventive services plan led to the closure of quick care clinics across Winnipeg. Does the Premier believe it was correct to close five quick care clinics around the city? The Honourable First Minister. So the Leader of the Opposition um, can make all the statements that he wants, that he and his colleagues want to fix health care in Manitoba, that it's going to take years to do so, but he doesn't ever state how he's going to do that. Just making a statement is not a plan, Mr. Chair. You know, the Leader of the Opposition should come out with his plan. Manitobans are looking. I mean, if he's going to be, if he wants to be the next Premier of the province, Manitobans are looking to see. What is his plan? Because I can tell you what our plan is. And I've just gone through a whole litany of, of things that, of good, positive things that are coming in the way of health care across this great province of ours, in all corners of our province. So where they chose back in the day to, to make statements like ending hallway medicine in six months with $15 million, those are things that never took place. You know, So we can't trust the NDP because we know from past history that they say one thing and they can make all the statements that they want, but the fact of the matter is they never got the positive results that they need, that Manitobans uh, needed, wanted, and deserved. And so we are committed to ensuring that, um, you know, we know that there's absolutely been some challenges uh, in the last couple of years with respect to a worldwide pandemic. Again, those are not uh, that's not something that was started here in Manitoba and something that's unique to Manitoba. That's something that has been happening around the world. You know, healthcare systems around the world, right across this country, have been challenged in, in ways that uh, we've never seen before. And so, of course, you know, here in, in Manitoba, uh, we've got some challenges, no question. Uh, but part of those challenges are, are staffing challenges, and, and we've talked about this, and we've had debates about this across the floor. Leader of the Opposition knows that. Again, he doesn't have a plan to deal with that. We have announced 400 new nursing seats in the province of Manitoba, and uh, we'll continue to look at uh, ways to, to work with the College of, of Nurses uh, to ensure that the internationally educated nurses get uh, licensed in the province of Manitoba so they can start working in the front line. Um, I have committed as well with my counterparts across the country and with the federal government, the Prime Minister and, and his ministers to work with them to to see how do we, you know, from the immigration standpoint, because immigration is extremely important when we talk about bringing people to our country. And immigration has been a negatively impacted in the last couple of years because of the pandemic. We want to bring more people, not just to our country, but obviously to our province. And we want to bring people who have the credentials that could go and work in the front line uh, of our healthcare system here in the province of Manitoba. It's not right that people can go elsewhere and across the country and, and get licensed, but they, they can't here in Manitoba. And that's the challenge with, with our college here in Manitoba. We've been trying to work with them. They've made some changes. There's more changes and improvements that need to be made. There's no question. But we need to look across the country to find ways to ensure that the federal government, and that's on the federal side, that they find ways to, uh, to look at what the foreign credentials are of those individuals who are coming to our country uh, in healthcare, but in other professions as well whether it's engineers or uh, whatever it may be, uh, architects, uh, whatever it may be, Mr. Chair, it's very important that we work together uh, across the country to, to uh, with, and with the federal government to ensure that we can move forward in this. We know that in order to uh, fix some of the, the challenges within our healthcare system, we need more people working within our healthcare system. That is, again, nothing unique to Manitoba, it is uh, a challenge faced across the country, and I look forward to working uh, with the other premiers uh, across the country and indeed the, the federal government uh, to ensure that we find ways to uh, respect those credentials and make sure that 
Um, we get people who are educated uh, for in certain professions that they have the opportunity to work within those professions, getting the necessary training that they may need uh, to, uh, to get them on those front lines, working in those front line areas in healthcare and, and other professions. We know there's a shortage of labor and, and again, we'll continue to work uh, with our counterparts across the country to help uh, find solutions to these challenges that, again, are faced across the country that are not unique here just in the province of Manitoba. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. The Clinical and Preventive Services Plan also calls for the closure of EMS stations across rural Manitoba. Does the Premier plan to continue with closures of EMS stations across rural Manitoba in communities like Grandview? The Honourable First Minister. Well, again, when the Leader of the Opposition and the previous NDP government were busy shutting down um, hospitals in rural Manitoba, uh, we're looking at ways to work with them, and that includes EMS services in, in our rural communities, as well as um, ensuring that Manitobans get the access to the health care services that they need uh, when they need them. That is not something that took place um, under the the days of the previous NDP government, but we are committed to working, to ensuring that uh, under our plans uh, that Manitobans get the access to health care that they need closer to home when they need it. And we're committed to that. Again, the Leader of the Opposition hasn't offered any solutions, any plan uh, whatsoever. Uh, he makes statements, uh, but statements are not a plan. You know, again, I think Manitobans uh, would like to know what his plan is. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you kindly, uh, Mr. Chair. Again, my plan would be to stop cutting health care, as the Premier has done. We heard in question period today how uh, some 30 beds were cut in Winnipeg alone. Um, to say nothing of the long-term care system. We know that throughout the pandemic, one of the key lessons we should have learned and that I thought was beyond partisanship was that we need to do better by seniors and other folks who live in long-term care facilities. And yet under the Progressive Conservatives, we saw in last year's budget uh, a funding freeze for operations of uh, personal care home beds in the province and a continuation of Brian Pallister's policies with respect to seniors' care uh, with this First Minister. Under Brian Pallister, this Premier's government committed to building 1,200 new personal care home beds. Does the Premier still agree that that is the correct target, and is her government still seeking to meet it? The Honourable First Minister. Yes. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. And can the Premier tell this House how many... Uh, just on a uh, matter of procedure, I think the... Uh, if the uh, Leader of the Opposition could repeat the question, I think we had a technical glitch and the mic cut out. Yes. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Can the Premier tell this House how many net new personal care home beds have been added to Manitoba's health care system since 2016? The Honourable First Minister. Well, again, I think those are questions best asked in um, the uh, departmental estimates of the Department of Seniors, which we're very excited to have a new Department of Seniors. I think it's indicative of uh, how important seniors are to our government. Uh, we established that, uh, that department 
um, last year, and, and we believe that uh, it's certainly uh, a very important um, to, for the advocacy of um, seniors and, and what they're wanting. And I want to commend the minister in his role and what he's doing and working with various stakeholders out in the community. He is out listening um, to those stakeholders, to seniors in Manitoba. He is hearing uh, from them and taking a collaborative approach with them and developing a plan and a strategy and he is getting things done and I, I commend him for the work that, that he is doing. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. So uh, not only have the uh, Progressive Conservatives not built any new personal care home beds, but our system is actually net negative when it comes to personal care home beds. So we lost some 200 personal care home beds with the closure of Parkview Place and uh, other uh, instances um, that occurred under the First Minister's time as Health Minister. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify whether she's sticking to Brian Pallister's uh, 1,200 personal care home bed target, or is this going to be a net target reflecting both Brian Pallister's failures and her own, which would result in a commitment to 1,400 net new personal care home beds. The Honourable First Minister. Well, I believe I've already answered that question. And again, the Leader of the Opposition, I'd refer him to the new departmental estimates of the Minister responsible for seniors. And I know that he is more than happy to answer those questions for the Leader of the Opposition. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Following the um, closure of emergency rooms at Concordia, Seven Oaks, and Victoria General Hospitals, as well as the closure of the urgent care at Misericordia, we saw uh, chaotic scenes at St. Boniface Emergency Room and HSC, such that those very important hospitals were put on diversion, meaning they could no longer accept patients. The government uh, brought in uh, their consultant to try and assess, was, assess what was going on and he said that the plan had been so poorly managed that he was effectively washing his hands of the PC government's approach to health care. Was it a mistake to so poorly manage the closure of these emergency rooms in Winnipeg by the PCs?
The Honorable First Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And again, um, the Leader of the Opposition uh, mentioned chaotic scenes uh, in his preamble to his question. And uh, I think I certainly can recall back in the, the days where it was chaotic in Manitoba's uh, health care system under the dark days of the previous NDP government, uh, where things were not going very well at all. Uh, at times when people, people were lining hallways and highways and, and uh, certainly there were big challenges in the system, waiting 33 hours in an emergency uh, department uh, to get, to only to, to pass away. Uh, that's the way their healthcare system was run in the province of Manitoba. Uh, Manitobans know that there needed to be some changes made that what the way that the NDP uh, managed health care in the province of Manitoba was, was not good. Uh, they couldn't manage it. They mismanaged it, in fact, Mr. Chair. And so uh, I know that um, you know, the Manitobans do not want to go back to, to those dark days of closing, uh, closing uh, rural ERs and closing access to health care closer to home and all of those things that they have uh, better access to. Again, I mean, we've come through a worldwide pandemic that's been a very significant challenge, not just uh, here in Manitoba, but around the world. Leader of the opposition should know that. Um, and uh, But I, I do know that uh, prior to the pandemic, we were making significant headway in reducing the time uh, people were waiting in, in ERs. And, uh, you know, ideally we want to move back and, and want to make sure that we, we continue to make progress when it comes to our ERs. I don't want to see Manitobans waiting for long times in our emergency departments. Uh, we don't want to see Manitobans waiting uh, for surgical procedures that they need, waiting in pain. We don't want to see that. We don't want to see them waiting for diagnostic services. Uh, in the province of Manitoba. Again, if we look at what the plan is, um, or lack thereof, of the Leader of the Opposition and the NDP, uh, what we see is that they will take an ideological approach, which when they do that, they will be preventing Manitobans from getting the surgeries that they need when they need them. They will be preventing Manitobans from getting the diagnostics that they need when they need them, because they will take that, that narrow ideological approach to the delivery of health care in our province. Well, we can't afford that, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, Mr. Chair. We, we, we can't afford that. Manitobans can't afford to go back to those days. Manitobans know that we uh, are working towards, uh, through our surgical and diagnostic task force, that we are working at reducing those wait times for those surgeries and for those diagnostic procedures. And again, um, you know, those came about as a result of a worldwide pandemic that was a significant challenge at the time, where surgeries had to be shut down, where diagnostics had to be shut down because we had to focus on those uh, and um, helping those who were most in need at the time through our, our uh, ICUs. And so, you know, we had to, to move resources over to, to help in those areas. And that was the prudent thing to do at the time to ensure that we, you know, uh, that we had the safety of those that most needed it at the time. But of course, that affects other areas of the healthcare system. If we had an increase the capacity, again, outside that system, where we're contracting out services, we're increasing the capacity there that is able to, to ensure that those who are waiting in pain right now for surgical procedures will have more likelihood to get them faster under our plan, under the, under the NDP plan or lack thereof, they won't get those services at all. And that worries me a lot. And we certainly don't want to go back to those dark days of the ideological approach when it comes to, to health care. What we want to do is a practical approach to ensure that Manitobans who are waiting for surgical procedures, who are waiting for diagnostic procedures, that we're able to find innovative ways for them to get them those, those procedures. Again, within a, a publicly funded system, a single payer system, but able to get them the services that they need. 
That's what our priority is. The Honorable and again, First Minister's the leader time has expired. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I, I heard the, the First Minister say that uh, closing health care facilities is bad, which is why we are listing the litany of health care closures that occurred under her government as well as her predecessor, Brian Pallister. They closed the emergency rooms at Seven Oaks Hospital, which serves not only folks in Northwest Winnipeg, but also the Interlake. They closed the emergency room which, uh, at Concordia Hospital, uh, which serves not only folks in Northeast Winnipeg, but also in Eastman. They closed the Victoria General Hospital, which serves people across southern Winnipeg, as well as uh, some parts of uh, rural Manitoba on the south side of town. They closed the urgent care at Misericordia Healthcare Center. They closed five quick care clinics. They closed the clinic on Cordon. They closed the clinic at St. Boniface. They've announced closures of many other health care facilities, and we're not even talking about the programs that they've cut, like outpatient physiotherapy, like cancer care, community clinics. So it's an interesting argument. Uh, the Premier is attempting to unveil as a, as a contrast argument, but uh, the PC time in office, I think, uh, certainly will create uh, a lasting impression in the minds of Manitobans when it comes to health care closures. The Premier speaks also of challenges brought on by the pandemic, but I just want to reiterate that ER wait times were rising consecutively month after month in the lead up to COVID arriving in Manitoba. What's more, the last respiratory illness season prior to COVID arriving here saw our healthcare system strained to the brink. And while other jurisdictions had to contend with COVID, Manitoba was unique among jurisdictions in being the first where our healthcare system collapsed. And that happened during the first minister's time as health minister. So when we speak about highway medicine, we speak about times under the progressive conservatives when Manitobans were sent out of province and were sent out of country to get health care services that would rightly be provided here. Can the Premier explain why the St. Boniface Emergency Room Project, which has been reannounced several times, uh, was originally projected to cost $90 million in 2019. In 2022, when the government got around to one of its many reannouncements, this project cost was now pegged at $141 million. That's an increase of some $51 million. Can the Premier explain how this project increased by 44 percent in cost in those intervening years. The Honourable First Minister. Well, again, I, the Leader of the Opposition is bringing up uh, detailed questions that are best answered, I think, in the departmental estimates of health that are right down the hall in room 254, and, and I know that uh, his uh, health critic, uh, I'm sure, is asking questions uh, in there, and I'm sure uh, you could send them a text and and uh, perhaps get them to ask those questions there. Uh, I will say, uh, however, when it comes to um, the St. Boniface um, ER uh, emergency department expansion, um, again, the, the details of, of those, uh, I think, certainly you can get in, in those estimates. I will say, though, uh, this was, yes, announced in, in perhaps um, 2019, 
Uh, I'm not sure if, if there were things that changed during that time, but I do know that what happened between now and then, of course, is what's called a worldwide pandemic. So uh, the leader of the opposition will know during that time that uh, many things were shut down, services, some services were shut down. Again, not just here in Manitoba, uh, but from, I mean, building services and, and being able to move forward uh, in some of the planning uh, phases uh, with respect to that. And so I know COVID did have an impact on, on some of that as well. And, and obviously um, that, could, that could have had an impact on it as well. But again, I'll leave that up to the Department of uh, Health uh, to explain further what uh, some of the challenges were. But I, I think the important part about it is that we're committed to that. And um, that project uh, will be uh, it, certainly when we uh, were at the announcement uh, just a little while ago, the people who showed up um, were very, very keen on getting this done, that this is a very, very important part of the hospital. And I know that the leader of the opposition started to talk the other day um, ne negatively about foundations in Manitoba, the, the incredible ph philanthropic work that has taken place in the province of Manitoba and across our country and around the world of foundations. Things that have been going on for decades. There's people who work very, very hard at, at raising money in these foundations, and they're very proud of the work that they do. And the leader of the opposition has said that he wants to just unilaterally shut them all down. That he doesn't want them to have any part of health care whatsoever at all. That's what he and his party is saying. And that's their plan. Their plan is to shut down foundations, health care foundations across the province. Because they don't want them to be involved in, in health care in the province of Manitoba. Well, we say that that is wrong, Mr. Chair. That is just plain wrong. And I want to, for the record, say to all of those individuals who have contributed over the years to those foundations, who have helped build various uh, parts of our hospitals uh, over the years, Mr. Um, Mr. Chair, those people have, have contributed, made significant contributions and just, you know, and the leader of the opposition's dismissal of the work that those people have done to raise those monies to help, you know, to help in our healthcare system is just plain wrong. It's certainly not something that we would ever, ever entertain. In fact, we, uh, we want to thank those individuals for the incredible philanthropic work that they do throughout our communities, not just for hospitals, but for, for other, um, for other very important parts of, of our communities. And I want to thank those people for the work that they do. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, I just wanted to return to the uh, topic that we um, uh, began the uh, afternoon discussion with. And uh, just to share that uh, the Winnipeg Police Service put out a press release uh, recently about the activity taking place on the front grounds. Uh, the police service press release, uh, and I'm, I'll read a direct quote here, quote, the Winnipeg Police and Manitoba government officials made the decision to dismantle uh, the camp today, and uh, end quote, in terms of reading uh, directly there. So I'm just wondering if the Premier can uh, convey what sort of, uh, you know, uh, involvement and contributions her government made to that shared decision with WPS. The Honourable First Minister. 
Uh, I think it's important to note here that, um, again, this is left up to law enforcement um, and the, the Winnipeg Police Service will work in conjunction with um, security as well uh, to get uh, their feedback and input into this, but certainly by no means is this uh, being politically driven in any which way, shape or form. Um, this has not uh, come to the political level. This is uh, being dealt with by the professionals within the system uh, to deal with this. And anything the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Yes, and uh, just wanted to make reference to that quote again. It said the Winnipeg Police and Manitoba government officials made the decision. So, so who would these Manitoba government officials be uh, in that instance? The Honourable First Minister. I, I don't know the answer to that question. That would have to be asked by the Department of Justice. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, could we ask for that uh, answer to be taken under advisement? The Honourable First Minister. No, I, I'll make it very clear to the Leader of the Opposition. He has the opportunity to ask those questions in the departmental estimates of the Minister of Justice. There is a way to, uh, to get the answers to those questions, and he can do it in that fashion. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Does the Premier believe the decision to close the Concordia and Seven Oaks emergency rooms prior to the expansion of St. Boniface emergency room was the correct decision? The Honourable First Minister. I believe I already answered that question earlier, and again, these are questions that are best uh, put to the Department of Health Estimates. I'm just gonna... The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Does the Premier believe that more private operation of home care services would be a good thing for the health care system? The Honourable First Minister. Well, again, um, you know, Leader of the Opposition, I mean, what we want to do is increase capacity uh, within the system. We don't take an ideological approach to it. I know the Leader of the Opposition does. That would prevent more, um, uh, more um, uh, spots from uh, pers personal care home beds from being built in, in the province of Manitoba. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I would say that there's partnerships that can be played with, that, that, that there's partnerships that can be had there. And again, I would refer any further um, questions or discussions about that to uh, the minister responsible for seniors who is developing that strategy on the personal care home side. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. So the Premier won't rule out uh, further privatization of home care. How about health care premiums? Are we going to see a, a return of, of health care premiums uh, as uh, Brian Pallister proposed? The Honourable First Minister. The Leader of the Opposition, I, I, I believe the previous question was about personal care homes. Oh, I, I, was, I was responding uh, personal care, to personal care homes. So just to correct the record on that. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. I'll just, uh, I'll just repose the question just to return to the one uh, that I just uh, asked. Um, so I was curious about uh, health care premiums. Is, is that something that's uh, on the radar here? Are we going to see uh, health care premiums proposed as we, as we heard from uh, Brian Pallister?
The Honorable First Minister. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're looking to make life more affordable for Manitobans, and uh, that certainly is not on our radar. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, does the Premier believe that we should reduce the use of agency nurses in Manitoba hospitals? The Honourable First Minister. Well, I think the important thing here is that um, we need to look at patients who need care. And uh, what I would say is that our focus will remain on getting that care for the patients. Uh, we have, again, increased um, the number of nursing seats in the province of Manitoba. Uh, we're looking to get our internationally educated nurses, uh, the credentials that they need to, uh, to get working on the front line. We're looking at uh, immigration, I mentioned this earlier, um, and increasing the number of uh, immigrants coming to Manitoba as well through our very successful provincial nominee program, which we are in the process of, of uh, revamping, and we have a task force uh, in charge of that, uh, spearheaded by Dr. Lloyd Axworthy, as well as the uh, minister responsible for immigration. And uh, these are very important ways that we can increase the number of nurses and, and health care workers uh, um, within our system. And uh, those are the, um, that's our plan. Again, the leader of the opposition has not offered any plan up whatsoever as to how he would uh, magically somewhere find extra nurses. But I think certainly in the interim, our focus is we want to ensure that Manitobans get the care they need when they need it. We've got um, our surgical and diagnostic task force that uh, is ensuring uh, that we reduce those wait times for surgical and diagnostic procedures for Manitobans. And uh, so, you know, to that extent, I mean, we have a plan. Again, the Leader of the Opposition has no plan. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Chair. But uh, I would then ask, uh, should it be an aspirational goal? Should we be trying to reduce the use of agency nurses in Manitoba hospitals? The Honourable First Minister. <laughs> well, I know the Leader of the Opposition likes to talk about aspirations and, you know, grassy knolls and all of these other things out there and what, what we could do and what we might do. The fact of the matter is, we've come out of a worldwide pandemic. These are facts. These are real issues that happen to real people. Uh, we have a challenge that, again, is not unique to Manitoba when it comes to surgical and diagnostic backlogs. But we have a plan to deal with those surgical and diagnostic backlogs. Again, the Leader of the Opposition has offered nothing up. Uh, we will continue to utilize uh, nurses, but again, you know, it, within that system um, uh, to, to fill in for, for other nurses because we need to ensure that people get the surgeries that they need when they need them. So again, we have a, a plan put in place, I just outlined that, um, to train more nurses, to get more nurses working on the front line here in the province of Manitoba. I've outlined that for him. Uh, again, the leader of the opposition has offered no plan or vision for the future uh, when it comes to this. Um, he uh, may have aspirations for a plan, I don't know. Uh, perhaps that's what uh, he's talking about today. Uh, I can tell you uh, we have a plan and uh, we will continue to work with stakeholders in the community to ensure that Manitobans get the surgical and diagnostic and uh, health care procedures that they need when they need them. The Honourable Official Opposition House. Will the Premier commit Leader. to reducing the use of agency nurses in Manitoba hospitals and to publishing uh, whether any progress is being made on this measure. The Honourable First Minister. What we will commit to is reducing the surgical and diagnostic backlogs that transpired as a result of the pandemic. The 
The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. I just want to point out that the surgical backlog uh, was aggravated by the cuts that the PC government made to health care. The fact that we had nurses leave the system uh, is a phenomenon that began with the closures and the cuts of emergency rooms. You know, I remember in 2017 and 2018 when they began these closures and implemented their plan for cuts, we saw nurses being forced into the hallways beneath the Health Sciences Centre where their jobs were being, which had previously just been deleted, aka cut, were then posted publicly for everyone to come and try and compete and jockey against one another uh, to land uh, a replacement job from. That sort of disrespect of the people who work in the healthcare system is a direct uh, contributor to folks leaving the healthcare system. And when you have difficulty staffing an operating room or a recovery room or an emergency room today, it's directly related to the cuts and the closures that this government uh, implemented and continues to implement to this day. The Premier mentioned transfers from the federal government. I wonder whether the Premier would commit that if the federal government is going to provide any new dollars for health care to Manitoba, that she would commit that every single one of those dollars would be spent at the bedside on health care in this province. The Honourable First Minister. Well, the, the Leader of the Opposition once again puts false information on the record. The facts of the matter are that we're spending a billion, or we're investing a billion dollars more uh, in health care than the NDP ever did when, when they were in government. And uh, those are investments that go to the front line of our health care system uh, to help Manitobans in, in need. So once again, his litany of false accusations uh, uh, run hollow out there to to Manitobans and for Manitobans. Uh, I will say that uh, we have, you know, the leader of the opposition knows we have signed a collective agreement with the Manitoba Nurses Union, and uh, that offered increases uh, to their their wages and and beyond just wages, but it's all part of the the collective agreement. And uh, so we are moving forward. That was a positive, I think, step forward and path to path forward to to helping uh, address the, the challenges faced within within the system. Uh, I think also uh, addressing it as well is is um, is offering up 400 more nursing seats uh, to the provinces as, as or for the province as well. And um, again, we've talked about the internationally educated nurses, uh, the importance of um, uh, immigration uh, to the province. We've talked about all of those things and. And again, that's, that's our plan and our vision for the future, whereas the Leader of the Opposition has no plan or vision at all for, uh, for the future. Uh, he will know that uh, as provinces uh, across the country, we have been talking about the Canada Health Transfer. And uh, I, I do know that over the years, I mean, some 60 years ago, uh, we were in a position 
uh, where between the provinces and the federal governments, the costs and the investments in healthcare were split 50-50. And uh, today, uh, that has been dwindled down to 22% by the federal government, 78% by the provinces. And so um, that's very significant. And this is becoming a larger and larger and larger part of our budget. And all that does is squeeze out other areas of extreme importance for, uh, for the province, areas like, you know, important areas like education and, uh, and uh, social services that are needed for uh, for Manitobans and uh, so we take that uh, discussion very seriously across the country we we would like to see that moved up to as as uh, provinces moved up to 35 percent we're not saying back up to the 50 percent where it originated but up to 35 percent for right now and uh, we've had those discussions with the, with the federal government what we need to do is get them at the table uh, to ensure that we can have um, those discussions further so that that money can flow to the provinces. And when that money flows to the provinces, it will be flowed right uh, to the uh, right into the, the health care system. And uh, so we need to sit down and, and have those discussions until we come to an agreement with the federal government. The, the rest of the discussion is, is moot, frankly, because we're talking about dollars that don't even exist uh, right now. And, uh, but we're hoping, and I'm, I'm hopeful, that we'll be able to move forward on this file because I, I think it's just, it's so important, it's not just for Manitobans, but it's very important for Canadians. And uh, so I'm hopeful that we're able to, to move forward on that file. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you kindly, uh, Mr. Chair. So does the Premier commit that if the federal government provides more health care funding to Manitoba, that every single dollar in Manitoba would be spent on health care at the bedside? The Honourable First Minister. Where we've consistently said is that we want this money, these monies to flow right into the, the baseline of our, um, of our uh, health care budget. Uh, we want to ensure that there's uh, better equity between the investments made by the federal government and the province. And so, um, you know, that's where those, those monies would go. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. But what, is there a specific commitment that all new monies from the federal government for health care will be spent on health care? The Honourable First Minister. Well, again, there are no monies on the table right now, an increase in the way of increases by the federal government, and so uh, we will look at that. But again, like we're looking at a, an increase to the base funding uh, that will, you know, in, in, into the, uh, the, health, uh, the health budget. So that's an increase to the budget. That would be, you know, directly to the bottom line of, of the health budget. I mean, I, I don't know if they're going to specify that it has to be, you know, uh, like I have no idea what they're going to look for in terms of how the monies would be required to be spent. Um, you know, I'm hoping we don't have to get into that and it just goes to the baseline funding, which increases the, the monies into the health care budget by that amount into the health care budget. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, will the Premier tell this committee when the surgical and diagnostic backlog dashboard will be made public? as was previously committed to in both July and then September. 
The Honourable First Minister. Well, again, I think uh, those are detailed questions that can be best uh, be asked uh, in the departmental estimates that are taking place right now in room 254, just down the hall. Uh, and again, uh, they can be asked of the Minister of Health in those estimates. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. I'd like to ask a few questions about uh, a price on pollution. Uh, does the Premier plan on bringing in a so-called Made in Manitoba carbon pricing plan this year? The Honourable First Minister. Well, for right now, they, uh, the federal government rejected, as the Leader of the Opposition knows, our uh, previous plan to deal with carbon emissions in the province of Manitoba. And uh, that was unfortunate, and uh, so that took place. Um, and now we're subject to the backstop uh, by the federal government. That was the that was the decision by the federal government again, uh, out of our purview. But what I will say, and I have been calling, and we have been calling on the federal government to put a pause on that for right now. Inflationary pressures are very, very significant uh, to Manitobans, and. Uh, we know that the carbon tax being imposed by the federal government is having a significant impact on affordability in the province of Manitoba. And so that's why we've asked them to, uh, to put a pause on that for right now. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, the, the Premier herself committed to bringing forward a, a Manitoba-based carbon pricing plan by December. Is that still her intention? Uh, to bring a, a carbon pricing plan like that forward um, by the end of the year? The Honourable First Minister. Well, again, the Leader of the Opposition will know that there was a plan in place and um, we had to take the federal government to court uh, for that. Um, and uh, that was ruled on where it was, you know, the federal government could impose uh, a tax on the province of, of Manitoba and, to, and on Manitobans. Um, so there was a, a plan in place that unfortunately they rejected. We tried to have discussions about that further. Um, but they just decided that they would impose the backstop. So we have no control uh, over that uh, in Manitoba. We don't believe that that backstop is doing what's in the best interest of, of Manitobans. Um, affordability is the number one issue out there right now. Uh, Manitobans are, are really, really looking at ways to make ends meet out there. That's why we've announced our $87 million affordability package. That's why we have taken um, other steps and measures to reduce uh, education property taxes, to give rebates back through MPI. We've done a whole host of things to make life more affordable for Manitobans, and uh, we'll continue to do so. And I, we think part of that as well should be uh, you know, and we have been calling on the federal government to put a pause on that carbon tax so that's not taking out of the pockets of Manitobans more money when they cannot afford it. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Yeah, just to, just to clarify and perhaps reiterate, uh, the court case that was lost uh, you know, just setting aside the question of all the money the government wasted on the, the court case over the years. PC suffered a loss uh, on that court case. And then the Premier after that came out and said that there would be a Manitoba-based carbon pricing plan that she would bring forward in December in response to that news. So is that still her intention uh, to bring a carbon pricing plan forward? The Honourable First Minister. Yeah, I think the, the Leader of the Opposition, I mean, in, in, in effect, we, we, we tried, but the federal government said 
that they were just going to impose the backstop. And uh, that's, you know, we didn't take them to court further to, um, to uh, you know, cause any more, you know, tax dollars to be spent on, on that. Uh, we accepted the, the court ruling on it, um, tried to just work with them on, you know, on that, but they decided that they would just impose the backstop. So there's not really much we can do there when they've, that's what they've decided to do. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just, I just want to just clarify that this is all an announcement that the Premier made herself after the court case. Um, again, the you know timeline with the federal government that she's laying out had to do with Mr. Pallister's carbon pricing plan and the court case that uh, you know he was very committed to and that uh, the PCs continued to pursue. Uh, they lost on November 17th, 2021, in response uh, and in announcing that there would no, be no appeal to that aforementioned court case, this PC government put out a press release. The final paragraph of this press release says, Manit and I quote directly here, Manitoba is developing its policy approach to the new federal legislative and regulatory framework with its December 31st, 2022 timeline, end quote. And this is attributed to the member for Tuxedo, the First Minister. So again, this is something that the, the Premier um, committed to. They put it in writing. It was a press release by the government. This was following all the court action. This was following the back and forth with the federal government. There was a public commitment by the First Minister to bring forward a carbon pricing plan by December 31st, 2022. Is that still the plan? Yes or no? The Honourable First Minister. So again, um, the uh, uh, what we what we did is we tried to work with the federal government outside of court to get our plan to, to try and have a conciliatory approach to work with them to get them to accept our plan. Our plan uh, would have would have been very very positive and and reduce emissions in the province of Manitoba. Uh, we wanted to take it out of courts and try and have. A, you know, a collaborative approach to things, and the the uh, federal government rejected that and imposed a a backstop. So we can't control that. But I think what's important is that we are taking steps in the right direction and getting results in Manitoba. So um, we've undertaken uh, a number of actions to advance uh, climate and, and green plan, and I'll I'll just uh, indicate some of those for the leader of the opposition now. Efficiency Manitoba has developed over 35 programs to help improve the energy efficiency of buildings and homes. Uh, the Conservation and Climate Fund has grown from uh, $600,000 in 2020 to $1.5 million in 2022. And the third call for proposals in May 2022 yielded 14 potential projects to help advance the climate and green plan. Uh, the efficient trucking program will save millions of litres of fuel and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by providing rebates for fuel saving devices and technologies uh, for heavy, heavy duty trucks. Uh, by increasing ethanol content in gasoline from 8.5% to 10% and biodiesel from 2.5% to 5% will reduce the tonnes of, of CO2 emissions. Uh, Manitoba announced an investment of $42 million to help Manitoba Hydro construct a transmission line uh, from Birtle South Station to the Manitoba-Saskatchewan border to expand Manitoba's capacity to export uh, clean power and, and support Saskatchewan in reducing uh, emissions. So those are just some of the initiatives that were taking place to support uh, a cleaner, greener environment here in Manitoba.
the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, thank you kindly, Mr. Chair. I just wonder if the First Minister could spell out uh, what she meant by tried to work with the federal government outside of court because there was this court process and then the PC government lost in court and then the Premier is asserting that after that loss happened in court that there was some process by which they tried to work with the federal government and then how does the statement from the November 17, 2021 press release fit into that timeline of events wherein the Premier committed to bringing in a carbon pricing plan uh, by the end of 2022. So I'm just looking for a timeline beginning with November 17, 2021 and the public statements that the Premier would bring in a carbon pricing plan that would bring us up to the present and update us on what the status of the Premier's announced carbon pricing plan would be. The Honourable First Minister. So um, we chose not to appeal uh, the decision to the Supreme Court as a signal of or a sign of, of goodwill. And we were hoping to sit down and have that discussion with, with the federal government. Uh, but they made it clear to us that they would reject that and they would not entertain any discuss further discussions uh, on that and that they would be implementing their backstop. They would not accept anything other than what they were doing. And so it was clear to us that um, they were gonna implement their backstop, which was, I think, unfortunate for, for Manitobans. Uh, and uh, yeah, leave it at that. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. So how was this communication uh, on the part of the province carried out to the federal government? This entreaty to try and um, offer uh, some sort of plan on behalf of Manitoba. The Honourable First Minister. Yeah, as with any negotiation, officials carried out uh, discussions and, um, and it was just found that uh, the federal government was refusing to accept where we were. Again, we thought it would be a sign of goodwill not to uh, carry this forward to the Supreme Court. We wanted to take it out of the courts, have officials have those discussions uh, and come to an agreement. Um, there was no agreement to be made and so they imposed the backstop. Oh, 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 hang on. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, and uh, I bid you a sincere apology for uh, not waiting for the uh, recognition from the Chair. Mr. Chair. Uh, so again, um, so what was the offer there? Like, presumably the, the, the PC government didn't just take the same, um, you know, scheme from Brian Pallister that had just lost in court forward to the federal government. So what was the proposal that was made uh, to the feds in this, uh, I guess, uh, outreach on behalf of the province?
The Honorable First Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I, I just go back and, and reiterate the fact that uh, we chose not to appeal to the Supreme Court as a sign of, of goodwill, that we could sit down and, and have a discussion there. But the Feds made it very clear to us that anything short of what um, they were proposing would not be acceptable. And so what we were proposing, which was under you know, our green plan in Manitoba, uh, they still rejected it. And so they imposed their backstop. We can't, you know, so we, we decided to do our own thing. And I, um, I read out uh, what we already um, have done um, over the course of the last little while to um, ensure we advance our climate and, and green plan. A number of initiatives under that that we decided to move forward on anyway to get uh, better results for, for Manitobans. Um, but it's unfortunate that the federal government um, you know, rejected that and, and imposed a backstop for Manitobans. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. You know, it's fascinating to watch the machinations in here as a response is discussed and then uh, shared. And, uh, you know, like there's all these uh, assertions made about, uh, you know, this uh, effort and that effort. Uh, and then, like, you have the historic record, right? Like the backstop was not imposed this year. The backstop was imposed years ago prior to the court case proceeding. So the federal government didn't impose a backstop in response to any entreaty from Manitoba. First Minister made a public comment at the end of last year to bring in a carbon price here in Manitoba. It's, it's a simple question, like, are you still going to do that or not? And of course I say you, through the chair, in a rhetorical fashion. Is there going to be a price on carbon implemented by the Manitoba provincial government. Um, Premier has declined to comment on that, but uh, I do find the machinations uh, fascinating because, again, like I'm looking at a briefing note here from this government, PC government briefing note. You know, just read into the record. Canada, and I quote, Canada requested jurisdictions communicate what approach they will adopt on carbon taxation on a go-forward basis by April 1st, 2022, including confirming that the federal tax will be administered in their province, developing programs of their own equivalent to or greater than the federal benchmark levels, or continuing to have the federal backstop applied. Period. Next sentence. Manitoba did not communicate its approach in advance of the April 1st deadline, end quote. Manitoba did not communicate its approach to the federal government. Those are the words of this government itself. So what does the neutral, nonpartisan, impartial observer make of the display this afternoon? when you have the government itself in writing in black and white saying they did not communicate and then we hear in this chamber that there's been, you know, this communication and that communication. What kind of communication? Well, we can't tell you what kind of communication. Seems to be an odd situation, you know. Again, it's a pretty straightforward question. Are you still going to do the, again, through you, the chair, are you still going to do this carbon price that you previously announced or are you going to reverse course, much as Brian Pallister did in announcing a carbon price and then rolling it back. So we're going to have that sort of uh, flip-flop again, just like Brian Pallister. I believe that's where a famous phrase was first uttered, yes, relating to uh, uh, pickerel. Yeah. So again, I just want to put on the record that the, you know, documentation of this government is at odds with the statements that we've heard in the uh, chamber today. But again, just uh, one more time. If yes, there is going to be a PC carbon price, is that plan going to be made public? Or if no, there's not going to be this uh, announcement in line with what the Premier previously announced less than a year ago, what's the rationale for the change? 
Why has there been a change? The Honorable First Minister. I think I've already answered this question several times for the Leader of the Opposition. We uh, did not appeal to the Supreme Court as uh, a gesture of goodwill uh, to try and put our, you know, to sit down and have a discussion about, um, you know, our plan. Uh, and they still refused. Uh, so what they did was uh, they, they didn't like our plan and, and so they imposed their own backstop or continued to impose their, their own uh, backstop. We were hoping that we could have those discussions and that they might change their mind and, uh, you know, with a more collaborative approach to things, but uh, they were not willing to go in that direction and impose their own backstop. So there is nothing we can do uh, with respect to that. The, Federal government made its choice, and uh, again, we think it, this is a negative thing uh, for Manitobans. Uh, we think that um, we are taking, obviously, uh, various measures already that I had uh, indicated to the leader of the opposition earlier uh, to help with greenhouse ga gas emissions in Manitoba, to help, uh, to help in that area that we continue to do on our own. And, uh, you know, and the, the federal government, I guess, can continue to impose the backstop. Uh, they continued to reject our, our plan. And so, you know, they made it very clear to us that anything short of what their plan was, was going to be rejected. Uh, even though in other provinces they accepted they accepted uh, similar plans to what we had. And, uh, you know, so that, that's just where it was, and it is what it was. I tried, I, we tried, you know, once again to try and get them to see the light, but we, we saw, obviously, that they were not prepared to change their position uh, and accept Manitoba's plan, and so they imposed their own plan. And that's the end of the story. There was no point in negotiating anything further when they had already decided to... Um, impose their back, backstop and they decided to continue to impose their backstop. So no further discussions have taken place as a result of that. What we have done is started to implement some good, um, some good policies which I outlined uh, earlier for the Leader of the Opposition. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. The Premier uh, asserted there that they had communicated uh, their approach to the federal government. But again, I just want to read from this briefing note again, prepared by this government, reflecting this government's action, which said on the carbon tax, quote, Manitoba did not communicate its approach in advance of the April 1st deadline, end quote. What is the impartial, nonpartisan observer supposed to make of the uh, cognitive dissonance between those two assertions? Both of them made by the PC government, I would say. One by a briefing note, one in uh, the chamber here this afternoon. And again, the Premier's answer there uh, also makes reference to the federal government imposing a backstop in response to the communication which the briefing note says never happened. And we know anyone examining the historic record or media reports uh, filed contemporaneously would know that the federal government did not impose a backstop this year in response to any government action here in Manitoba. That backstop was implemented years ago. So how does that reflect upon uh, the answer that was given here? Again, I think the Premier should just uh, make a clear statement as to whether there is going to be that PC Manitoba carbon price um, by the end of this year, as she announced uh, less than a year ago, or if there's not going to be that uh, plan. I mean, it seems pretty straightforward, right? You would think. So perhaps I'll just leave it at that. The hour being 5 p.m. Committee rise. Call on the speaker.
The hour being 5 p.m. Close one. The hour being 5 p.m., this house is adjourned and stands adjourned until tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. Have a good evening.